Okay, folks, I hope you can hear me all right. Down, okay, I, is that better? Okay, so calling the meeting to order, but before we get right into it, there's a few announcements. One, we are being streamed on YouTube, uh, so mindful of appropriate language for public meetings. Now, when speaking, you can, uh, I think you can figure it out pretty well yourself. The microphone has a speaker button. When you want to speak, of course, raise your hand so that we can see uh, who wants to speak. And then when you speak, you can just turn your microphone on. When you're done, uh, please turn it off. Okay, the first item on the agenda is uh, adoption of the agenda. And we need someone to make a motion to adopt the agenda. Okay, Glenda, I need a seconder. Art, thank you. Any uh, comments on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? No, no, that's passed. Okay, declaration of pecuniary interest. Anybody have any uh, conflict of interest there? Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, adoption of the minutes of January 18th, 2023, task force meeting. Okay, need someone to, Glenda uh, and Pat Warren. Okay, any opposed or any comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll consider that passed. And number five is a depu deputation by Mr. Chris Schultz. So welcome, Mr. Schultz. Hello. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody here for uh, letting me uh, speak for a few uh, minutes today. Um, active transportation is uh, quite important to uh, both uh, myself and my family. And uh, I know he's not here, but I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Peter uh, Petrosoniak for inviting me uh, out today. Um, so uh, to start off, um, I uh, live about 100 meters away, uh, just on Francis Street here. So uh, it only took me about two minutes to walk over here. Um, myself, my wife, and um, our two kids um, live in town here. Uh, both my wife and uh, myself are uh, very active cyclists. Uh, we like to walk everywhere we can, um, uh, you know, within reason in town. And uh, our daughter, uh, as well, is a very active uh, cyclist. And uh, our son's only two, but he seems quite keen. Um, I think, uh, you know, first of all, everybody here, I, I'm assuming, is, uh, you know, quite uh, interested in um, active transportation. I think overall, um, citizens who you know, walk to work, walk to the grocery store, uh, bike to school or uh, bike to work, uh, generally live healthier, more active lives. And I think that's very beneficial to uh, provide to uh, citizens uh, in town here. Um, so uh, to start off with walking, um, first of all, I, I think this town does a better job than most. Um, the In front of my house, within hours of a snowfall, the um, uh, the sidewalks are all cleared, and uh, citizens, whether they're young, old, um, can uh, use the um, use the sidewalks to get in and out of town. I previously lived up in uh, Port Perry, and oftentimes um, the elderly or young kids would have a tough time getting to and from uh, school, to and from work, or to doctor's appointments. So, um, bravo to everybody here responsible for uh, for doing that. Um, as far as uh, walking, I know there's a, um, a little bit of a uh, mentality around a 15-minute city. And all that really is is to, to have everything as close as possible to you so you don't have to hop in your car. You know, that might be a family of four might only need one vehicle. Um, and, uh, you know, we're in most municipalities in North America, two, um, two vehicles required to get around. So... We're sort of privileged in the fact that uh, in Lindsay and uh, the other communities in Kawartha Lake, they are relatively small. And if there is a focus put on keeping the size of the town relatively uh, small as we grow, we do need to welcome new citizens. But if we sprawl out too far too quickly, many people will be left with no other options than to hop into their car. 
Um, so now to go down to uh, cycling. So it is a very big passion uh, for uh, both myself, my wife, um, but my family. Um, I really think there's three types of uh, cyclists. There'll be uh, enthusiasts who uh, use cycling mostly for fitness. They might go out for one hour, two hours, four hours, up to 100 kilometers in a day. Um, and this first group has very extensive needs for cycling, but uh, we can generally make do with, with what's available. Uh, it's very easy to um, hop on a road, feel comfortable with traffic, um, get outside of town, find a gravel road, a rail trail, and go for you know, 20, 30, 40 kilometers one direction, turn around and come back. Um, so while this group um, you know, sometimes can be very loud, obnoxious, and very pro-cycling, um, I, I really think that this group um, can sort of make do with what's available. Uh, the other two groups would be recreational cyclists and uh, cyclists who use uh, cycling for transportation. Uh, so when it comes down to a recreational cyclist, this will be your kids um, hopping on a bike, going to a park, or adults going to their friend's house for you know a barbecue or, uh, or whatnot. And for this group, safety is by and far the number one concern. So my daughter, she's four, she turns five in June. Um, and you know, we're nervous with her hopping on the road. I mean, bikes should not be on sidewalks, right? But, but that is the only safe spot for them in a lot of parts of town. And you know what, when it comes to recreation, that's a choice that people are making. So busy roads, fast vehicles, these are all barriers to getting more cyclists using, um, using their bike as a form of transportation. Uh, so a safe network developed to provide these, uh, these children or these adults a path to get to either a park, a skate park, a pump track, whatever it may be, is probably the number one way to encourage recreational cyclists to go out, hop on their bike instead of hop into a car to go to a, a park or hop in the car to go down to the uh, new skate park at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, and uh, so as far as limiting traffic, it's probably uh, contentious. Uh, there are ways to do that. We have big zero streets, right? We have Colburn, we have Kent Street. Um, so on Francis here, there's no reason that somebody should come off of William Street, drive, erratically, aggressively, too fast down a residential street to get a couple streets over to bypass lights. Um, so there are, there are ways to focus automobile vehicle traffic onto uh, main streets. Um, a good example that, uh, so my daughter and I, we go on the, um, the waterfront trail where the rail trails quite, quite a bit to get from point A to B. You're not stopping every block and you can cover a good distance, you're removed from traffic, and it's actually a really good example that uh, would really help recreational um, cyclists. As far as uh, people using bikes for transportation, uh, this is good for everybody. Um, so I uh, used to do most of my grocery shopping on, um, on my bike. I know some people would, uh, would laugh at that, but uh, I had a trailer for my kids and uh, you know, I'd have my daughter there, I'd, I'd load up 30, 40 pounds of stuff. It's a better workout for me. And, um, and I would do that. I did that in Port Perry. Unfortunately, I go to Food Basics and the area on uh, Kent Street, basically from Angeline all the way to Highway 35, is just terrible. Uh, it's terrible for pedestrians. It's terrible for cyclists. Um, I also uh, have a motorcycle. It makes me nervous going down that way. And to be honest, for, uh, for automobile drivers, it's not the best either. Um, People using cycling for transportation could be someone that has a uh, place of employment two or three kilometers away. You know, it's a bit of a walk, but uh, with 10, 15 minutes on a bike, then you can arrive there. Um, and also, in uh, some of the towns in Kawartha Lakes, we do have social economic issues. Um, automobile ownership can be expensive. The maintenance of the vehicle. I mean, we don't want vehicles on the road where people aren't maintaining the vehicles. Um, the, the cost of ownership of a bike, the lack of licensing requirement, the um, inability to have a license for whatever reason can make 
transportation by cycle, uh, cycling, very advantageous to this group of people as well. And um, especially in a town such as Lindsay, where you know, you're a few kilometers away from each edge of the town, um, it can make it very approachable for people to use all the facilities in town. Um, again, a huge barrier to people that will choose their bike instead of a car is safety. And in this case, it's not people just going out to a park. They need to get around town. And this is where bike lanes become a necessity. Um, there's a difference between protected bike lanes. They're you know, much more permanent. Uh, they are safer and, uh, and probably beneficial on some of the busier routes. But uh, any bike lane where it's delineated, marked, where you can cross intersections in protected areas can make it feel much safer for, uh, for the average cyclist. Uh, so uh, any own closing, I'd just like to thank everybody here for uh, giving me a few minutes to speak to you. Um, I, I do really think that uh, a focus on active transportation from both uh, pedestrian safety and cycling safety would be um, uh, very beneficial to the citizens of, of not only Lindsay, but uh, every community in uh, Kawartha Lakes. Um, so I look forward to uh, sitting here and uh, listening to the rest of the uh, meeting, and thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, just before you go, anybody have any uh, questions? Okay. Oh, Glenda? I, no, I just want to echo what you said about the snow clearance because I noticed this year, I live in Lindsay also and walk everywhere, this year particularly an improvement over previous years. And one of the things I'm very grateful for is uh, even the salting that comes before the freezing rain. I, I see the salt on the sidewalk and I thought, uh-oh, bad weather ahead, but they're, they're ahead of the game and it makes such a huge difference because the ice uh, is much more treacherous even than the snow. But anyway, thank you so much for, for this. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Glenda. Yeah, no, it's, um, so we moved up here uh, two winters ago and uh, it's night and day about uh, the accessibility for, for every citizen with the, um, the snow clearing and the salting. It's, it's been fantastic. I'd like to thank you for your discussion. I think it's great. I'm, I'm with the cycling club, so obviously I'm, I'm in favor of, of cycling. Um, I don't think the jocks are perfectly happy. I, I still think there's ways we can do things in rural roads that'll make it safer for the people that do go 40, 60, 80 kilometers. Um, and with the advent of electric assist bikes, it makes a huge difference. And I think um, it's one aspect that we should be aware of because in lots of the world, people do shop with trikes or bikes and they have large containers in the back where they can put everything into. And with the advent of electric assist, almost anyone can do it. And so it, it would really make a big difference if we had the facility to do that. And you're right, Food Basics is a, is a bit of a challenge. And when they put the subdivisions behind it, they didn't put any way of getting in there, which is, to me, was a little bit ridiculous because it's ideally we should be able to go shop and, and use our bikes to do that. Thank you. Anyway. Yeah, no, that's a phenomenal point. Everybody likes to consider, uh, you know, people from uh, the Netherlands as, as cyclists, but uh, they really aren't. Uh, the average uh, Dutch person, they, they don't use um, cycling as a form of recreation. It's just transportation for them. It's, it's like you or I getting into a car. Uh, for them, it, it's just hopping on a bike and they have these cargo bikes and, and everything else. And it's just a way of life. So very good. Okay, I think no more questions. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. All right, I better put my glasses on. Okay, next item. Any, uh, was there any correspondence, Nancy, at this point? Okay, no correspondence. So now we move on to 7-1, uh, which is the SIMA update on project status. Great, thank you. Update on project status. I think it's a little bit more at today's meeting. Um, we have an update, uh, a workshop. Uh, you can see, and for those who are online for your benefit of explanation, we have maps. We have a series of uh, working discussions today. Uh, and yes, some information to help inform those discussions. Uh, so we hope that this will be much more than just an update. We really hope that this will be a very collaborative conversation about the foundations of the active transportation plan, which are twofold. 
One, the network. So the actual infrastructure and the design and what we're proposing to put on the ground physically. And the other are the recommendations. So what can the city do with partnerships such as yourselves and other key agencies to move active transportation, no pun intended, forward through policy programs, uh, implementation strategies and processes, and a number of other topic areas. So those are our two core components that we'll be talking about and workshopping today. And then we want to wrap up and have a conversation about the role and the intent and purpose of the task force going forward as we continue through the project and beyond the project as well. So again, meeting purpose, we really want to start to work collaboratively on these two core foundations. We have been listening, we have been documenting, we have been uh, responding to any and all of the comments that have come through. I can say with confidence that we feel like we have heard from many people and many task force members, can we accommodate all the requests that are made, likely not, but that doesn't mean they don't go anywhere and they get left behind. It just means that they may not be able to be captured in this version of the network or this version of the recommendations. I was kindly reminded by Richard that these plans are updated almost every five years, maybe a little bit longer. Every year there should be an annual update on what's happening, on what's going forward. These are only some of our mechanisms and opportunities to continue to monitor and update what this plan holds, what it does, and what we're trying to achieve. But we want to really focus on what we can do now through this active transportation master plan as it connects with our trails master plan update, which I understand was adopted by council last night. Congratulations, um, as well as a forthcoming transportation master plan that will be done by Public Works. So if you had uh, the benefit or if you decided to join the council presentation that I was doing on the trails master plan, you are establishing an exceptionally strong planning framework to address infrastructure, programs and policies related to active, sustainable mobility within your community. And that is absolutely amazing. Once again, as we work through this active transportation master plan, and I put this up very often, um, but I like to include it, we are committed through this process to making sure that we facilitate conversation and collaboration, that we continue to build partnerships. We are focusing on taking action as much as we can building in the considerations and the acknowledgement around equity and sustainability, and also making sure that we use this process to generate momentum. Uh, and you can really feel that through the conversations we've been having, not only through the Trails Master Plan, but also through the Active Transportation Master Plan as well. So general project update on where we're at, and this is the interesting thing about planning projects. They evolve. Uh, they, what we envision they will be at the very beginning changes, and that is necessary because we are responding to, and we are uh, adapting, and we are considering the input that we receive, and sometimes that changes the direction that we're taking or requires a bit of a new approach. So right now, we are at what we formally call our second round of engagement, but we really are uh, pivoting to make sure that we can start to build out this plan sooner rather than later. Um, and we are focusing on, as I said before, the network and the recommendations so that we can start to move forward with the development of the actual master plan, uh, working towards hopeful presentation and adoption in fall or late this year. As part of our initial meetings, we started to talk about this plan being as ambitious as possible, but also realistic. 
And I was really pleased along with my colleagues to hear from the task force that there was support for and encouragement around these five ambitious goals as the cornerstone and as the foundation for the active transportation master plan. We continue to weave all of these considerations through the various components of the development of this plan, going back to them for consideration, for evaluation, uh, for integration. So we have looked at through this network process, making sure we have routes and opportunities that give access for all. We have looked at focusing on the urban and built up areas and growth areas, as well as uh, some of the future areas uh, within the communities as walkable places for people to live and visit and to get to and from their destinations. We are prioritizing safety as it relates to cycling, but also considering the perception of comfort and connectivity throughout the various areas. We are intending to be consistent and respectful, making sure that we have an understanding not only as active transportation users, but as other road users, users of how to effectively and respectfully use the roadways and the trailways together. We also want to make sure that this plan is feasible and realistic. We use this term within the Trails Master Plan as well, but we want it to be evergreen. That is a nice green reference, but it also means that there are opportunities for us to update, to monitor, and to manage the effectiveness of this plan. We've had comments about making sure that this plan doesn't stay on a shelf and doesn't collect dust. Once it's out of our hands, we hope that it gets into the hands of great leaders within the city and partners like yourselves who will continue to drive it forward. So this plan has legs in the short, medium, and long term as much as possible. So once again, these five commitments and ambitious goals that we have are very much continuously being considered, woven through our development, and also integrated into whatever we are presenting to you and discussing with staff and other stakeholders. I wanted to take the opportunity, and I apologize for all the content on the slide for those on Zoom, uh, those of you who have the slide in front of you. You'll be able to read this in a bit more detail, but I'll go over some of the highlights. We are committed to using all of the avenues we can to integrate this master plan into the other ongoing work that is happening at the planning scale and implementation scale at the city both direct and indirect. So in terms of the Trails Master Plan update, um, of course at the time last night was when it was adopted, but uh, we are continuing to use that document and integrate that document as you'll be able to see in the maps for connectivity from a network and infrastructure perspective, but also from a consistency perspective around recommendations so that there isn't the conversation of trade-off between trails and active transportation, between on-road links and off-road links. They should be integrated together so that it is a holistic conversation about getting people out of their cars and using walking, cycling, other self-propelled or accessible modes to, and I loved your reference, Chris, around touring or the enthusiastic riders and uh, users recreation and also transportation day to day. Uh, the task force would have remembered that we have the different user profiles, the different considerations of different types of active transportation users, and we are going to continue to consider those and build those into uh, the development process. We also continue to work with Richard and other city staff to monitor ongoing development and leverage those opportunities to identify where we can build in active transportation enhancements. Um, and we know that we want to uh, continue to use those so that we can work with developers to bring in that infrastructure in the early building stages as opposed to a retrofit down the line. 
And then there are ongoing other planning initiatives, whether or not that's uh, upcoming transportation master plan, as I referenced before, environmental assessments that are happening for major corridors, such as Colburn Street, that's already been undertaken. Um, but all of these are part of the deep dive and consideration into these network recommendations preliminary, as well as the development of supporting recommendations for the master plan itself. So we're going to get into the actual proposed preliminary considered active transportation improvements, routes, preliminary facilities, connections, linkages. This is our part two. For those who are joining on Zoom, I think there are still a couple. We are going to be getting up and having a bit of an interactive discussion with the maps that we have here. Um, I believe that you can still contribute by joining in in the audio. So if you do have a question or a comment, uh, please let us know. But for your reference, we will have a couple of slides and then we will have a bit more of an interactive discussion with the maps that we have here. How do we develop an active transportation network? How do we build out a system of continuous and connected walking and cycling facilities, routes, improvements that make people feel safe, comfortable, excited, connected, and linked within their community and within the various communities of the city of Kawartha Lakes? We base the development of the network on this commitment to connectivity and continuity and safety and access, but we also have a very strong framework and set of parameters in which to build it. We are focusing on walkability and bikeability, specifically within the built up areas, um, not because they're more important, but because they are more intensive transportation hubs, if you will, with and again, I'll look back to you, Chris, great reference and connection, which have the great potential to be uh, efficient and effective locations for people to get to and from. I hesitate sometimes to use the term 15-minute cities because of some of the connotations that are going around right now, but I think you hit, hit the nail on the head. The size and scale of these communities already lend itself so well to being able to access in direct ways the destinations and areas that you need. Um, and even with growth, the potential just uh, grows um, and does enhance that opportunity. So uh, we do focus on these built up areas while also selectively improving touring cycling routes um, or other routes within the rural areas that get you between other municipalities to other major recreational destinations um, and for some really interesting riding routes or walking routes uh, for touring or enjoyment purposes. We obviously build upon all of the recommendations that have now been adopted through the transportation, through the Trails Master Plan update. We are leveraging as many opportunities as we can to build upon the development that's happening. We're making sure we provide access to major and minor destinations within the various communities and within all of the city of Kawartha Lakes. I've said it before, I will say it again, we are prioritizing comfort and safety, and we are designing feasible solutions that are consistent with the current guidelines and standards that are out there right now, and that are realistic of the context and conditions of those roadways and of those areas that we are designing. So these are our bases, our assumptions, the framework or the foundation upon which we looked to developing the network. I've mentioned this in the previous slide a little bit, but this infographically shows how we are focusing and building out that network. We start first with the major areas, the communities, the built up areas, and we look at strategic improvements to cycling conditions and linkages, as well as a focused assessment of walkability and overall walking and accessible experience. We then build out and we look to wider connectivity between those areas where we look at strategic improvements of promoted, currently promoted cycling routes, as well as new routes to improve connectivity. 
There's already a great foundation of shoulders, whether it be gravel or paved or platforms that could accommodate that, that allow us to enhance some of those connections. And we want to leverage those opportunities as much as possible as well. I won't get you to read all of these details, but it is a bit of a refresher and a reminder if you want to go back to them after this meeting, that we are committed again to these three core components um, as part of the network and what this means. So as you look at the network recommendations, very preliminary that we have identified, please make sure that you feel comfortable with how those have been represented relative to these commitments. Yes, Glenda. Yeah. So the way we look at that is we'll find those locations within, say, Lindsay, and we'll do a 100 meter buffer around it. And we'll make sure that within that buffer, there are connections to cycling infrastructure or walking supports. So you have direct access, maybe not to front of door, but to within that 100 meters so that you can easily get to a route um, as opposed to having to circuitously find it somewhere else. Uh, in the city. At a maximum, at a max, so at a maximum. So we would at least, we would hope to be direct to front of door, but if you can't get there, then we want it to be at least 100 meters away. Yep. And those are more general destinations that are, as we have up here, places of employment that aren't as frequent use by active transportation users. So the categories for primary are, as you can see, schools, parks, community centers, even more so libraries, um, club spaces, uh, enhancing that a bit further. We do have the details around exactly what that includes as one of our previous presentations, I believe, but it's a, a pretty long list that connects back to our different active transportation users as well. Great question. Thank you. And working through the approach, just so that you know uh, how we have gotten to this place of proposed preliminary routes, uh, we have worked through a very iterative approach where we're building in data collection, field analysis, engagement, uh, and review of the network as much as possible. Last time we met back in January, we had presented to you a series of candidate routes, which meant they were routes that we were considering to be part of the active transportation network. We then went through a very robust process, which I'll talk about in a minute, of reviewing each of those routes relative to input that we have received from all avenues, public stakeholder yourselves, uh, data that the city has, data that we've collected, uh, roadway conditions that we've gathered, a full gamut of information to refine that down uh, to this preliminary network and series of improvements. So a refresher on those candidate routes, uh, that is what we presented in January. At the time, we had primary, secondary, and tertiary routes which represented the degree to which we had given them sort of importance or need for improvement or the intent of that route related to connectivity uh, or design. We built those out by looking at the existing and previously proposed or promoted routes uh, through whatever is on the ground now or what is in planning documents, including but not limited to the Trails Master Plan update. We looked at future development areas. We looked at existing demand from data we'd collected or publicly available data. We looked at what would be needed relative to what the condition of the roadway looks like. And we also looked at what would be needed from a design perspective and what was being asked of us from an engagement perspective as well. Yes. So when you mentioned uh, about you looked at other studies, so did you re review the Tribute Lands input, input Study from 2023? It's a huge document. Did you consider that when you were 
putting together this plan? It was one of the documents that was provided to us uh, as part of the background review. So we did look at that, absolutely. And that was part of the initial consolidation of both the trails plan as well as the active transportation master plan. So I do know that we, we went through that. That's where the recommendations come into play of uh, where you defer to other documents um, as opposed to using something like this document as well. So there's a continual interplay between the two as to which one would be used over the other. Okay, thank you. Yeah, great question. Thanks very much. Hey, Richard. Thanks, Claire. Quick question. Um, I mean, obviously, we're looking at uh, different AT routes, and, and especially in urban areas. Are Are you going to be able to provide us with some direction on how to handle uh, the private side of things. So obviously, you know, say for example, this gentleman here, Mr. Schultz said he wants to go shopping at Food Basics. Um, or is there, uh, can you provide us with some recommendations on say, uh, uh, infrastructure on the private side? Great question. That's been a bit of an ongoing discussion. And I think that there's two parts to that. One, the simple answer, which is yes, uh, as part of the development of design guidance and guidelines as part of this plan and the recommendations there, we will be providing some suggestions on how to incorporate active transportation into development applications. I also happen to know that that is something that is also being explored from the transportation master plan side of things um, when they do embark on that process. So I think that's a really good indication of it happening not only at the planning level, but also at the implementation level too. Great. So in terms of how we assessed each of the routes, I have this available on my computer and can bring it up and go through each of them, but we felt that that wouldn't be the best use of our time. But what this shows on the screen, albeit small, is a snippet of our review that we undertook. And we've gone through two steps, um, two really strong steps before and after the existing condition review. The second step is around the candidate route considerations. And this is where we gathered all of the review of our desktop and in-field assessment, also looked at what that public support has been through public engagement, through task force comment, um, through route conditions. And we decided if that route would proceed or not. So this is where you start to see that refinement from that candidate system down to a more specific and focused network. So we had a point in this process where we said, there isn't maybe a lot of support here. The conditions are really challenging to get in a safe and comfortable and connected facility. It would possibly cost a lot of money where we could find something alternative that would be just as good. So this might not be the right location to put an active transportation connection. So that was the first part of the assessment. The second one was looking at what that active transportation improvement would need to be and what it could be. And so we looked at the first step of Ontario Traffic Manual Book 18, which I'll get into a little bit more for cycling. We looked at the volumes and the speed of the roadway to get an initial suggestion of the level of separation. And that's what you see here on these maps today for cycling. We then looked at if there was uh, sufficient width for that facility based on the detailed data that the city has provided us. We looked at whether or not there was parking available on that street and if it was being enforced. We looked at if there was a sidewalk on that corridor, one side, two sides, no sides, what that looked like. And then we looked at whether or not there needed to be a walkability improvement as a result of that. The next layer of that was looking at utilities and environmental constraints and context constraints. Are there things within the right of way or just outside of the right of way that are either preventing us or enabling us to be able to put in the facility that would create a comfortable and safe and connected environment for active transportation users? And at that point, we then took a pause and said, does this route proceed? Yes or no? We are showing you the results of that assessment. We have some thoughts on the roads that would proceed, those that would not, and we're looking for your input on that today.
We will then be going forward with a more detailed review of what exactly the facility would look like, what exactly the improvement would look like. We will cost those and phase those, but those are some next steps. We wanted to pause here to get your thoughts on the initial preliminary connections. So I talked a little bit about Ontario Traffic Manual Book 18. For your reference and your resource, these are the tools, some of the tools that we used. There are two nomographs, which, as I'd mentioned before, plot the volumes of the roadway and the speeds of the roadway and give you a level of separation or an initial type of facility that you could consider. This version of OTM Book 18 is unique now and updated because it looks at urban and suburban environments and rural environments, acknowledging that they are different and they function differently and as such should have uh, their own unique and different types of treatments for cycling. So we have worked through that process and we have applied the appropriate nomograph depending on where that roadway is within the city. And then we also took an additional detailed review to weight out the different types of uh, facility treatments to look at what we could reasonably uh, try to implement within that space based on more detailed context specific considerations. So these are the tools that we are using and leveraging to inform our cycling assessment and what you see on the maps today. And what we are showing are a couple of layers, if you will, and just so that you have an understanding of, of what we are showing when we have that conversation. In the cycling context, we still have primary and secondary routes. We have combined secondary and tertiary because they kind of had, they ended up having a bit more of the same intent um, and we felt as though they were still uh, quite similar. So we have the primary direct spines of north, south, east, west connections uh, within the built up areas connecting these major destinations. We are committed to a much greater degree of separation for cycling infrastructure. Uh, and there is a lot of emphasis on connectivity here. The secondary routes build out that connectivity, but uh, more are focused on providing access to unique features like trails or minor community destinations. Uh, these are more localized, not always shared, but localized design interventions and gives greater access throughout the communities. Uh, you can see on the maps that we have shown where some of the routes haven't proceeded already. And then there's three color codes. The lightest green is fully separated infrastructure that we're suggesting, physically separated bike lanes, cycle tracks, or in boulevard multi-use pathways. Those are the green. Orange are designated facilities, and those are conventional bike lanes or buffered bike lanes with painted lines. And the last one are shared facilities, which are signed bike routes, neighborhood bikeways, or advisory bike lanes. So you see those in the urban area. And in the rural area, it's the green are the buffered paved shoulders where you may see additional painted line, possibly a rumble strip, possibly some bollards. Uh, orange is the shoulder. It could be gravel or paved, depending on the condition. And red, similar to the urban areas, is the shared space. Yes, Art. I just have a question on gravel shoulders. I, I really don't like to see that in there. I, I mean, for most people that are riding on roads, they'll go on the road. They won't go on a gravel shoulder. And it doesn't, and maintaining it is extremely difficult to keep it so that you can actually safely cycle on it. I, I don't know where that came from. I haven't seen a gravel shoulder being a possible infrastructure for active transportation. For walking and everything else, I agree with it, but it's very difficult on a road bike to go along a gravel shoulder and you're right beside the traffic, you could easily go right into the traffic. So I'm not sure where that came from, but I don't support it. I'll give you an example, um, and it's not something that we're necessarily widely entertaining, but in Oxford County and in Norfolk County, there and a couple of other areas, and we have heard this through some of the economic development conversations that we've been having, that there is an interest in fat bike gravel riding. In fact, there are... Um, yeah, right. So it's it's not that we're advocating for gravel shoulders, but we're acknowledging that there could be some routes where there may they, there may be interest in um, keeping the gravel for that sort of unique opportunity. But it, we're not um, 
we're definitely not looking to continue to advocate those. I, I agree completely with our club. The biggest growing sector is gravel riding, and it, it opens up tremendous opportunities in the city of Cortha Lakes, and gravel bikes are probably the favorite bike now. So I understand that. But on a road, uh, people will go on the pavement. They will not go on the side. Okay. Yep, and a great comment. So thanks, Art, on that one. It's, in again, in these preliminary considerations of what could be possible um, and acknowledging that there is kind of that growing industry. And there are also some roads where uh, they are currently gravel and we may want to maintain them that way uh, for that type of, of use as well. Obviously not a shoulder per se, but acknowledging the gravel presence for sure. Great comment. Thank you so much, Art. So I won't go through each of these maps in detail, more just acknowledging that we have them here and we will talk about them uh, afterwards as well. Uh, and we'll pause once we get through the walking review. Uh, but you'll see that the thicker lines are our primary routes of which there are a number of green, bright green, physically separated uh, initial suggestions for those connections uh, in addition to designated uh, options as well. Uh, those link together and they provide access to some of those major hubs and then the additional connectivity building out. In the context of Bob Cajun, uh, you'll note that this does mimic in some locations the Bob Cajun Active Transportation Plan routing um, and it also looks to some of the improvements and opportunities that we have from a trail perspective. Within Fenland Falls, uh, we have a couple of routes that are uh, we are suggesting do not proceed, and that's only because of the density that we're seeing as well as the access or the need uh, within the community. Uh, we really feel strongly about these access points uh, to the trails, but also to some of the major destinations and schools and uh, providing those opportunities for access as much as possible. I will note that when we went through this review um, and when we go through the details of it, there is quite a bit of conversation about overall traffic calming and what that looks like to uh, accommodate and be able to facilitate the, the different cycling and walking improvements. It's interesting to look at Ontario Traffic Manual Book 18 right now because the threshold for designation and separation of facility is much lower. And that is great. We think that is excellent. That is necessary. But for roadways that are 50 kilometers or more, that's the threshold, 50 kilometers, you are moving into that category, needing a dedicated cycling infrastructure or separated cycling infrastructure. So if the city is open to and willing to entertain a reduction in speed. And we're seeing that more often in communities, uh, whether that's school safety zones or uh, on corridors that are neighborhood bikeways or uh, other designated uh, active transportation corridors. Seeing that reduced speed would bring us into a space where we could have shared infrastructure or could have something that's dedicated as opposed to the fully separated need that we are seeing in a number of locations now. So. There is an interesting series of conversations that I'm sure we will need to have going forward about what that means to reduce speeds, um, and that's a really great opportunity to have those traffic calming conversations as the city goes forward with the transportation master plan that they're planning to undertake. Uh, again, just going through some of the uh, the mapping, which we will go through in a bit more detail uh, on the, the walls here afterwards. Uh, connectivity as much as we can in the north and the south. Uh, we did have to strip away a bit of the density within the rural areas uh, purely from a focus perspective um, and having more of that dedicate, dedicated inf and separated infrastructure or uh, physical uh, separated shoulders and dedicated shoulders. Uh, we 
still fully support the touring cycling routes that are in place right now, and those would not go away. Uh, those would continue to be promoted. Uh, and in fact, we would likely encourage and suggest uh, additional signage and wayfinding for those linkages. Uh, but in terms of improving the infrastructure in these strategic locations, uh, these are where we think would have the greatest impact uh, in terms of the need for the users and the potential users going forward. And then we shift to walking improvements. And I will say that in the past, in active transportation plans, they have been lumped historically. Uh, you do a walking review, and then you look at kind of some sidewalk gaps, and that's no discredit to great work that I've done in the past or colleagues have done in the past, but we're now moving towards looking at you know, cycling and then walking because they are two different, very different functions and two very different needs in terms of improvements. So when we looked at walking, we took a deep dive into the built up areas. We looked at the destinations, major and minor, the distance of trips, experience, also uh, where people need to go, transitions, what the barriers are, um, and also looking at the different types of roads that are there. We still have the primary and secondary considerations uh, within the walking, but the commitments to improvement are a bit different. So for primary corridors, we're suggesting walkability improvements to all of those primary corridors. We want to see benches. We want to see lighting. We want to see other rest areas. We want to see an overall walkability enhancement along those corridors. In other areas for the secondary routes, sometimes for the primary too, but that's where we want to see more of the traffic calming. We want to see the speed reduction or other traffic calming interventions so that we can create those spaces that are more conducive to, to walking, but also cycling as well. We have done a bit of a gap review of the sidewalk system. So on the corridors, you will see recommendations for sidewalks on one side or sidewalk on both sides. And those are strategically identified based on the rest of the active transportation routing. And then we also have looked at areas for mid block crossings or general intersection improvements where we have routes for cyclists and now walkers. And we know that something needs to be done at those intersections to make sure people People can get safely to and from and across as much as possible. Yes, Daryl. I just I just wanted to uh, point out that intersection improvements and crossing improvements um, should not be just strictly focused on walkability. I think, uh, as um, mentioned before, uh, there's a huge component in cycling. Um, pedestrian crossovers are great for pedestrians where there's pedestrian-only facilities. But uh, there's great benefits in cross rides and other things in OTM Book 18 um, that um, can be Im implemented at intersections all around town, all around uh, Court Lakes to make cycling safer. And I think that that should be captured on both the walkability and cycling portion of the plan. So um, you can install uh, multi-use paths, bike lanes, but if we don't improve the intersections to accommodate both cyclists and pedestrians, um, it's not going to work. Great point, Daryl. And that's why we start with the cycling and then build out the walking after. So as you'll see, the intersection improvements don't currently have examples below them. They're definitely not just PXOs, to your point. Um, as we have the intersection improvements primarily along the corridors where we have physically separated and designated infrastructure, the idea would be to put those cross rides, those transitions to accommodate everybody. So it's the walkability is the catch-all layer for walking accessibility and general transition building out from the cycling system. So great examples. Just so we're not uh, forcing cyclists to dismount, right? We don't want, we don't want to, we don't want, we don't want to be dismounting. <laughs> Agreed. A uh, broken up trip is not one that I like taking whatsoever. Um, and I think there are, to your point, many more great precedents and examples of easily putting in cross rides, but also bike 
signals as well as other treatments too that um, why we intentionally hadn't put all of those examples there yet. What we'll need to do next is look at uh, exactly what we end up confirming for those facilities and then uh, provide some suggestions based on OTM Book 18 or TAC or otherwise uh, of what that transition would look like. Um, just kind of like doing a little background, I noticed that uh, major projects on the city website, the Angeline Kent intersection is a great example, uh, appears to be reconstruction 2027. Um, the from reviewing the EA, all of the alternatives that were shown in 2019 or whenever it was done, uh, it's all curb face sidewalk. There's no, um, you know, potential for AT. Looks like there's going to be four lanes, um, very limited um, pedestrian and obviously cycling opportunities there. So I think that, um, you know, before um, a project like that is set in stone, that, you know, uh, this project, maybe that should be revisited. Uh, you know, to make sure we do get cross, if we're going to do multi-use paths on Kent Street and Angeline Street, that we do get cross rides at Kent and Angeline before we build that intersection and we can't, um, you know, accommodate those improvements. That's a great point, and it is always an interesting situation to navigate the different layers of planning and design and implementation process. And that is why we have done our best to work with Richard and other city staff members to understand what's kind of coming down the line so that we can leverage those opportunities. Um, I'm not saying or committing to the fact that we can change anything per se, but we're trying our best to uh, know what those projects are and where they're at and and try to influence and encourage them. You know, I, I look to a great example of the Colburn Street connection bridge that's being, the design's being undertaken right now. And, you know, we're working with that consultant too um, to make sure that we're building in uh, as much as we can, recommendations around active transportation. Um, so where we can, we try to influence absolutely and encourage um, others to to try to advocate for that as well. Great comments. Thanks very much, Daryl. Uh, so again, our maps that we have here illustrating all of those features. Uh, again, the difference being that we don't have the rural area maps for walkability, and that was intentional. We had said through our commitment to uh, the network review that we would focus on walkability within all of the built-up areas. So that's not to say that walking won't be considered in the rural areas, but uh, it's a bit more generalist there where uh, pedestrians can use the shoulders to be able to walk. And we acknowledge that when we recommend improvements to the rural areas, as you'll see on the map over here, uh, that we'll have to consider both walking and cycling to some degree uh, on those connections as well. So just going through some of the maps, and you'll note that we also have on here the Trails Master Plan update proposed trail projects uh, to make sure that we're coordinating and integrating those as much as possible. So we wanted to go through um, a couple of exercises where we talked about the network and we talked about some specific examples um, that we're looking at. Um, and we also wanted to use the opportunity to go up to the maps and have some conversations about them. Uh, so the first example that we have, and great segue <laughs> to Daryl's comment, and a street that we spent a lot of time talking about, I think, Brandon called me a couple of times a day for a couple of days uh, about just the varying conditions and the varying, the variation of uh, Angeline Street as we started to look through it. And again, this is at the master plan level. So not preliminary design, not detail design, um, but we want to be as realistic and feasible as possible. You know, it's an arterial road. It's 50 kilometers an hour. The volumes are 10,000 to 12,000 vehicles per day. So in that case, you know, you have sidewalks and you have a, you know, a good number of lanes of, of travel, um, for vehicles, but with those thresholds, you are absolutely needing a physically separated piece of infrastructure on that roadway. Um, and 
what we need there relative to the space that is available. Uh, there's some different options. Uh, do you need that third travel lane? Could you remove that? Uh, can we leverage the boulevard space? Can we widen sidewalks to implement uh, a multi-use pathway? Uh, what can we do to make sure that trip is consistent and continuous so you're not asking people to jump from one side of the road to another, except maybe where there's a logical crossing and a cross ride? <laughs> Controlled intersections, exactly. So, you know, this this particular corridor is an interesting one because it is an absolutely direct north-south connection that is in a critical location between the built-up area of the city, uh, the town, I should say, and new development areas. It's got a lot of destinations. You know, the very end, you have the college as well um, and a significant number of trails. So we wanted to put this back to the task force as well and say, you know, what are your thoughts along these corridors? Right now we're showing physical separation as much as we can um, from the northern component. And we have felt as though we had to remove a little piece where it was really quite constrained. Um, but in terms of your thoughts of how this roadway is functioning and relative to the need, uh, where where are we thinning, sitting and what are we thinking with this? Daryl? Should be a multi-use path. Done. Done and dusted. We will put one down. <laughs> I, that is the direction that we're going in. I mean, when you're looking at that roadway and the way it, it's functioning, it... Uh, there is need for for turning uh, into many destinations. Uh, sometimes there's conversations to be devil's advocate. Sometimes there's conversations about frequently frequency of driveways relative to multi-use pathways. So we are very aware of that too. Daryl, over to you. Just going to say, um, I, I don't want to bike on Kent Street or Angeline Street with my family. Um, I want to be biking on the boulevard. Yeah, not in, not on the road between the curbs. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Thoughts on Angeline? We're picking, yes, Glenda. So if it were, say, a multi-use pathway, then it would be a uh, green, a uh, grass buffer uh, between the multi-use pathway and the curb. If it were going to be, and you can see that little example at the top, a buffered bike lane or a cycle track, it would have a painted line at a 0 0.5 buffer with actual bollards, or it could have a concrete precast curbs to create physical separation. There are a range of options in new OTM book 18 of what that physical separation could be. You kind of get down to that level of detail once you start moving into the details of the project. But something on road, what Daryl is entirely against, I'm joking, um, what Daryl's entirely against um, is to have something physically in between the cyclist and the car. In that example, you would still have your sidewalk for your pedestrians, but the bikes would be in that designated space with physical separation. All right. So the, the issue here is that you've picked this as one of the main uh, north-south routes as opposed to Adelaide, which is right next door to it. it so Adelaide is also, uh, that is a piece that we are putting as a secondary connection on our network. But this one, we feel we can actually get some physical separation into this roadway right now. So uh, at, sorry, uh, the other linkage you mentioned is still part of the network. Okay, okay. You know, we use Adelaide because it has lights and everything else. It's much easier for us to use. We yeah. do not use this road. So physically separated would be great. Be very helpful. Yeah. Right now on Adelaide, we have, uh, so that designated, which could include a painted line with a buffer for the bike lane if we put in something there like that. Yeah. But yes, Glenda. So let me jump over here and I'll show you uh, what we're thinking of. I understand a general speaker kind of works. 
So right now, we have Angeline from Thunderbridge Road all the way down to Kent as a physically separated potential piece of infrastructure. So that, that whole component. Angeline between Kent and Mary, very tight. Unfortunately, passes by a school, so hard sell there, but it is extremely tight for the physical separation that we are desiring in that section. The for Adelaide too. Sorry? For Adelaide the, and Parallel. Yeah, so I'm just gonna go through the, the Angeline, and then for Mary, all the way down out of the town, that would be designated. So it's pretty much the whole piece except for Kent to Mary, which to Brandon's point, gets covered off by Ange Adelaide, pardon me, which we have a piece of bike lane or buffered bike lane with a painted line uh, on that connection. That would work? <laughs> I like that. So, you know, we really tried to, where we could, get as much as we could within these roadways. Some may need to be redesigned, reconstructed. Others, hopeful reallocation and retrofit of the space or expansion of the sidewalk as much as we can. One, one second before you, Daryl, I promise. Um, and what you'll note is that our candidate routes were every, pretty much every single north-south connection within Lindsay. Um, as much as we could. We have tried to, because density truly is a conversation, we don't have an infinite amount of money here, focus of what we can get in that doesn't compromise comfort and safety, and at a minimum meets what the guidelines tell us we should have, if not trying to get a bit more to improve the comfort and safety if the space allows. Glenda. Um, it was on the data bus, it was still a bus going down Knowing that we'd have to get into the you know full analysis details, we are not. We do feel confident that the lanes right now could accommodate that. Brandon, if you want to jump in and talk about some of your your review of that, happy to. Yeah, sure. I mean, there are there are buses running down Angeline, so that was definitely considered in our review. That was one of the kind of categories we looked at whether there was bus stops and bus service. Um, so for sure that's that's considered again that gets into the detailed design is is it gets there are some challenges accommodating the bus stops with the facility type but we're not kind of doing that level for this analysis um, yeah I mean it's there are ways to tackle those treatments and and we're trying not to dramatically change the I mean a lot of depends on what type of project you're going to do whether you do a retrofit so you know, speaking to whether it's uh, part of the reason we put, we did this example um, on Angelon is because we had some other ones I was going to put on the slide, but this one's a tricky one. Um, you know, you can use the curb to curb space you have, which is sort of that separated bike lane idea. But I think long term, once you do more extensive road reconstruction, then you do something in the boulevard so that you can solve this, those, those sidewalk gap problems as well as provide a cycling facility uh, but there's some options there so that's kind of what we want to talk about um, and then there's also this this network question of um, Angeline Angeline and Adelaide are, are kind of a two an interesting pair um, because this is a busy road but you've got a lot of destinations right on it um, you definitely need separation but you have some opportunities there um, Adelaide is interesting because it's actually a local road, but it has really high volumes for a local road, which we'll talk about when we get to the network. But um, we definitely consider bus service to go back to your really original question. Yes, thank, thank you. And my apologies for not using the speaker before. For anybody who wants to know, my question was about the possibility of accommodating buses on Angelite. Thank you. We definitely want to balance that, especially in the pedestrian network. We de and when we're thinking about pedestrian issues for this, this isn't all about cycling either. Is is we want to we want to facilitate. There's a real connection between walking and transit, and of course, Lindsay has transit service, and I expect that's only going to increase. So um, and, and and things like the crossings and the sidewalk service to to complement that bus service. I think that's I think something we're really laser focused on. Um, a really important aspect of the plan. 
Daryl, I think I saw your hand up. Uh, I, I, I appreciate uh, the, that portion of Angeline being really tight. I know that there's other quarters in town that are tight, but it just seems like such a important link, um, you know, with that Southwest quadrant, so many destinations, you know, the college rec center, uh, schools, um, the trail, um, that we should at least be protecting for it. Like, I mean, it might take a reconstruction of uh, Angeline Street to make it happen um, just because of the width uh, or the, the right of way. Um, but it just seems like such an important link to, to leave out, um, you know, especially to have a, an in Boulevard facility. Um, you know, I, I appreciate Adelaide, Adelaide Street and a, a lot of people will use that. Um, but to have an uh, in Boulevard facility for um, all types of users on Angeline Street servicing all of those destinations, I think would be, um, you know, I think that's very important um, to the city. And that's a very fair point, and that's why we do this engagement, because this is our initial take on the network, um, and that's also why, through the steps that I high level went through, there's always that category of, you know, what is the input, what are we hearing? Uh, if there is a resounding significant amount of support for this corridor, enough so that the city feels like they could push for something bigger <laughs> there or along, or along that link, then absolutely seems like the main main street in town right like i mean why are we uh leaving it out and and let's just clarify we're not leaving all of it out just you know a, a segment where we feel like alternates are you can reasonably and feasibly put in those alternates um in maybe a more efficient way uh, we've talked about this through the trails plan and through this plan this network is a 20 plus year network, if not more. So next layers are phasing of the links that we end up confirming. So if we end up putting that segment of Angeline back on, if you will, absolutely a possibility. Could see that being a long-term project as opposed to maybe a short-term. And these are long pieces, right? Angeline from top to bottom, long pieces would likely have to be segments anyways um, over the course of a series of phases but if the intent is desired that's why we come for the consultation and the engagement as well yeah thanks um <clears throat> thanks Daryl. just to add to that i think that section of angeline would be sort of a longer term project everything is pretty close in there it's an older part of town so uh to your point we could include it but it would be a longer term project. So I think the Adelaide sort of go around is, is sort of a phase one. That makes sense. And then, uh, and then the Angeline reconstruction would be, we'd have, to, we'd have to do a lot of expropriation of all those properties along there. And we may not get enough land as well. Uh, so, but it's something that we can sort of take a look at in the sort of the medium to longer term. Um, I did review the uh, GIS on the city's website. I did notice that there was significant right away on the west side as opposed to the east side. That looked like there was quite a bit of right away. I know that it is residential, and I mean, that is, you know, not ideal, but um, it did appear that there was significant right away on the west side of Angeline Street. Yeah, and that's a, another great point, Daryl, is uh, so we've been looking also through the trails plan and through this plan, looking at land ownership. And uh, that's also why we look at the utility placement, the environmental considerations, all of those. Um, this made it to this stage, uh, well, to the last stage and didn't make it currently through to the next, but it wasn't at that time kind of prohibitive. It was to Richard's point, there were other, and what I mentioned earlier, others that could be more feasible. So I wouldn't say, as you've said, that it's something like maybe some of the other corridors where it's, there's no way that we can do anything here, but longer term. I said, let's just protect, protect for it is all I'm saying. Great point. 
Pat, would you like a little bit of a quick update on where we're at? Um, I don't mean to single you out. Are you sure? Okay, we're just at the network. We're talking about different components and segments of the network. Um, all maps are open for discussion, um, as well as some select corridors too. Uh, we have cycling improvements, walking improvements, uh, and a range of different options that we're considering for those areas. Art, did I see you? I thought you were hovering around the microphone, anticipating a comment. <laughs> How did you know that? Um, I'm just thinking about the intersection of Canton, and uh, that's already in the planning stage. And we have tried to address things that are already in the planning stage with the with the city, and we've been totally shot down. So is that in stone? I mean, the, the look at. 2027 was it that uh, where that's supposed to happen can that change that last and we tried to do uh, Main Street and both in in and Lindsay and and there was no way that anything was going to change in terms of that um, because it had already had an environmental assessment and that took place I think four years earlier and we don't want to go there again so we're, we're dealing with stuff that's way back in the past that where people did not even think about active transportation or want to and we seem to be hamstrung that we can't do anything about decisions made in the past so the question is if that is already done what are the chances that politically we could even think about changing that there's two answers that I have, and then I'll send it over to Richard. Uh, one is based on the term that you used, the political will, and then also the design capacity. I don't have an answer for what you can or cannot change uh, because I'm not a city staff member. But what I do know is you happen to be the first group who are seeing this network because we wanted you to see it first. We will definitely be doing engagement with public works and having conversations with them about what their work is and where that is at and what's possible uh, going forward. We need their buy-in to this uh, <laughs> more than if not equal to any other uh, department in addition to planning. So it's, um, it's definitely a further discussion that we need to have. Richard. Thanks, Claire. So, so to answer, to answer your question Art, on, on, I think 10th street, uh, you had been dealing with Chris Marshall before. Um, what happened was the, the environmental assessment had been approved uh, as a process was approved by council. Therefore, staff weren't willing to sort of go back and and go back on the design because the design had been finalized and that was that essentially was what happened in that instance i know of colburn street there's there's the whole discussion about the environmental assessment again having been approved i know that i know that the one of the designs that had gone through did have bike lanes on it but that's not the design that was approved um it, we're having a lot of discussions right now with respect to that area of town and, and and highway 35 upgrades as well so i suspect that some of those upgrades will happen in in a couple of phases when that whole jennings creek area starts to uh, develop and fill in so you've got craft They've got, they're probably going to end up with about 750, 800 homes, as well as a commercial block. Tribute's going to have about 3,000 homes, Tribute North and South. <clears throat> so there's going to be a phasing in of, of road works as the demand is needed. And so there's, um, and I should probably check with engineering to see what Colburn Street, uh, what the EA uh, does, if there's a phase one or phase two for that. And then there's there's going to be sort of improvements on Highway 35, but you know we would like to. I mean, obviously, one of the things that I think is really key here is to get the active transportation master plan approved, have it sort of fit in with the transportation master plan. And and my goal has always been is to have this as a separate document, but feed into the feed into the transportation master plan which then gives you the whole the whole picture for roads which then we can put into our official plan so that we have all those standards in the official plan then we can sort of go back and say you know engineering department when you're when you're uh, doing environmental assessments for road upgrades this is what the official plan says it says road right of width 
and we need active transportation on that as well. Um, to answer your question about Angeline, I don't know what if the EA is still current. If the EA is not current, then we will have to go back and review that and then ask engineering to consider uh, active transportation within that right of way. The good news is north of uh, north of Colburn, we're fairly, we have been taking widenings as development has been coming through in accordance with the Town of Lindsay official plan. So there's, there's a lot less work that we have to do to acquire land. I think we have land in this section here as well, simply because it's, it's sort of newer development. I know when the fairgrounds redeveloped, we took, we took the widenings there. I think we have the widenings on the, on the other shopping center side. So I think it, it would be fairly easy to, to accommodate it from a design perspective, but those are some more discussions that we're gonna have to have with engineering. I think we probably have a better shot at that if it's still, if it's still a few years out than we maybe had with Ken Street. So hope that answers your question. A long-winded response. Telling, you're telling me it's complicated. Yes, Pat. Thank you. Um, just on that, uh, Richard, uh, going forward with all the development and and, and widening of streets, um, multi-use trails comes to, to mind. So um, going forward with, with all the development, I know some of the plans have already been nailed down, like tribute, but maybe there's some wiggle room there to, to get some multi-use trails through some of these new developments. Just for the record. Sure, yeah, and I, I believe we are working on a multi-use trail from uh, basically through craft and trivia um, on that main street A that goes that goes north south. So that is that is in the works. Um, both developers are are happy to uh, provide us with the uh, the width. So that's that's uh, that is in the works. And for the benefit, some additional context. We did speak a little bit earlier about the fact that. Richard has been plugging us into development conversations, or at least we have been provided with the applications to whatever degree it's possible to share those with us so that we can give some recommendations as to how active transportation can be more effectively incorporated and asked of the developers to incorporate into those, those plans of subdivision and site plans as well. So we have had the opportunity to think about how it connects to the trails plan, to what we're thinking of for the active transportation plan, and, and leveraging those those opportunities too. Our interpretation of a multi-use trail when we recommend it is that a minimum three meter width of trail asphalt which would be for cyclists and pedestrians, put in place of a sidewalk or a sidewalk with a dedicated cycling space beside it at about 1.5 to 2 meters. So there's a couple of different treatments in OTM Book 18. Um, you can also have a much wider one. It's 3.5 to 4 meters uh, within the guiding document uh, would be uh, the ideal width uh, if you have it on one side bi-directional traffic, um, but there's also some other treatments too. Brandon, did you want to add a bit to that? Yeah, I have a bit of experience with multi use trails. Um, there's a lot of, I'll just note, there's a lot of places and things that are sometimes called multi use trails that are really, uh, it, they were a lot of just trails are called multi-use trails, but yeah, the current standards, we're building them two standards so that they're cyclable multi-use trails, which means, yes, at least three meters. And actually, going back to a previous question, like I think when we're planning something on a corridor, we really are assuming that a lot of those best practices in the most updated guidelines are applied, and that means trying, at least trying within the design to allow for cross rides. Um, a lot, and there's even updated treatments like making sure you're marking through driveways and intersections, um, clearly signing them, having pavement markings that have literally a picture of a bike and a pedestrian and a walking person on them so that you know what they are. So um, yeah, if we're building a new multi-use trail, 
it's not like a two meter wide gravel track <laughs> or grassy area or something. It's it's paved. It's it meets those minimum standards, um, of which there's even you know there there's question the separation. It's on the boulevard. You're not right next to the road. Uh, various things. You don't have poles that are sticking out. That sort of thing. Um, obviously, when it gets to detailed design, there are issues, but um, by following the new standards, I think you have something that's that's cyclable and, and safe for multiple users. Yes, start here and then next. Just to be perfectly clear, the multi uses are pedestrian and cycling, period. Oh, maybe. In the context of the active transportation master plan, we are only talking about active modes, walking, cycling, self-propelled or accessible supportive. Great, thank you. Yeah, you know, just to answer my question, I think in my experience in the parks in the past, multi-use was used for everything. It included walking, cycling, snowmobiles, ATVs, horses, the whole works. But in this context, you're right, it's just walking and cycling primarily. You're right, John. And as you can tell from past conversations, which we are not focusing on here right now, but in the context of the two other plans, uh, the two plans that are ongoing, multi-use when you're in parks and open spaces or along trails that are outside of the boulevard or outside of the roadway, you expand that user potential in this plan, when we're talking in Boulevard, within the road right-of-way, it is just active transportation users. Okay, I'm looking at the time, um, and I don't want to rush through, but we probably want to break for lunch relatively soon. So I'll take uh, a little bit more time to go through some of these other examples. And of course, you know, we did share these materials in advance, but you'll probably need a little bit more time to sink your teeth into all of the routing and all of the considerations. And uh, we look forward to more detailed comments on the different route options after this as well. So we leave these behind, but we'll move on to the next example, which is East Street in Bob Cajun. Uh, so again, a very critical primary corridor that has been identified in the Trails Master Plan update for uh, upgrade and enhancement uh, for trail comfort, as well as looking at the Bob Cajun Active Transportation Plan. So this is a very significant corridor, uh, not lost on us. Uh, we still have that 50 kilometer per hour speed limit. Volumes are, you know, a bit lower than what we had on Angeline, uh, as you can see there. It is an important north-south connection and has a pretty critical crossing uh, of the river. We see a huge transition between the use and the land use surrounding uh, within this area, a uh, kind of mix of rural road type, but not in a rural area area or a transitioning area. Uh, we are looking to have, because of the primary nature, physically physical separation, um, potentially look at new sidewalks and definitely pedestrian improvements and walkability improvements along the corridor because it's primary. We know that there are constraints, not only with the existing infrastructure, but where the utilities are, uh, where we see the placement of businesses and also just the scale of the roadway. Uh, we do see this as needing to be quite transformative as a corridor um, itself, and you're seeing that consistency between the plans. So the buildup towards that need is very strong. Uh, so again, range of options for facility types, whether or not that's a cycle track, something a little bit more interesting and progressive, uh, or maybe in behind the utilities multi-use pathway if we thought that would be possible, but uh, something physically separated and uh, a high need for this to look a bit different going forward. Any thought? Yes, John. Yes, thank you. Um, this is uh, near and dear to my heart because I'm from Bob Cage and I don't live far from the uh, picture on the screen there. And just uh, by the way, uh, the poster boards that are behind you here, um, that was part of our active transportation plan, public open house. We had a couple of artists 
writing things down, <clears throat> pardon me, as people were inputting ideas to the consultants and they were doing their presentation. So when you get a chance to look at them, maybe at, at lunch, um, they're worth taking a look at. Um, the focus on those is that the act of transportation should be uh, inviting, attractive, comfortable, and safety as a very strong component. So when you're designing the streets, it's not just about getting you from A to B, it's a lot more to it. On this particular uh, situation, first of all, I had a question for uh, Richard, and again, to sort of inform the group around the table, from my experience, um, new active transportation routes can be done when new subdivisions, new roads are built. So you can get it done pretty quick. But when it comes to adding improvements to existing roads and crossings and so on, it's often coordinated with upgrading the whole road. So you've got all the infrastructure below grade, you've got the infrastructure above grade, and then you can start thinking about the pavement and the sidewalks and such. So that's why some of these things are gonna take five, 10, 20 years to put in place. And even then they'll have to go in stages. But once you get a quality plan in place, then the city's got something to work from. And that's why this is so important to do this today. On this particular one, the picture you see up there on the screen, that's actually facing southbound, um, looking down um, towards Mill Street. And uh, on the left of the picture is a considerable berm that was built by the developer years ago to protect uh, or sound barrier between the houses to the left and the highway itself. There is a paved shoulder. And to make this more user friendly and attractive, at the base of the, below the spruce trees on the left of the picture there, is about a 12 foot wide corridor that's just utilities. And it's beyond the drainage swale of the highway itself. The prevailing wind comes from the right side of the picture to the left side of the picture, and it's the pits to walk up and down the shoulder of that road at any time of the year, not to mention the amount of traffic on the weekends. So I had, um, or I'd like to suggest, if, and we've talked about this with some of the city staff, if we could make that uh, path at the base of the berm there, the walking and cycling path to get you from Mill Street up to Canal Street. And um, on the opposite side, the west side of the road there, the right side of the uh, picture, there's again a gr quite a drainage swale there, and there's a, an armor stone wall at the top. Could perhaps that same walking cycling path parallel it way back from the road shoulder itself. I know that takes money, but um, it would sure make a, a heck of a difference there. If you're gonna spend money at all to put in active transportation, and the city owns that property on both sides, so that's, that's one hurdle out of the way. So that's my input. Otherwise, I like the, um, the layout you've got there in below the picture, that's, that's spot on. Thanks very much, John. And you know that was one example of uh, that potential improvement for physical separation, but to your point and to our previous conversation in boulevard or offset multi-use active transportation pathways, absolutely uh, one of the considerations for these primary corridors. Uh, I agree with your assessment of how projects get implemented. And while cost and timing and coordination isn't part of this discussion today, we are going to be having them as a result of these conversations and weighing those options and what's possible to be done at what time as well. Anything you wanted to add, Brandon, on our context considerations around Bob Cajun too? I mean, here, I would just add before I jump into, you know, the great system and your point about Rob Voigt and Dan Burden's great work through the, you know, Bob Cage and AT plan is excellent. You know, we're almost reiterating a lot of these connections. We're trying to give that much more detail on what is possible. One of the recommendations in that plan is to move forward with the cycling and improvement routes consistent with OTM Book 18 and other design guidance. So we're almost doing that next step as part of the plan recommendation, and we've talked to that too. So um, we do very much reiterate and echo that connectivity that was already in that plan, um, trying to find what those feasible solutions are. Pat, and then any additional? Thank you. Um, with the Bob Cajun plan, um, in the capital budget this year uh, is engineering money for a stop uh, stoplights at that intersection by the bridge. And part of that, going forward hopefully next year, um, they would have to put the lights in with, with sidewalks um, 
proper sidewalks at that intersection. So that could be a start to that corridor. Um, and I was just wondering, um, a lot of areas in the city are going to 40 kilometers an hour. So, I mean, Angeline, um, uh, East Street. Street. Yeah. Is, is it possible to, to actually lower that more than 50 to 40? In, the whole point, especially East Street, because um, we've also uh, got a set of lights the other side of the bridge, so that will slow down traffic a lot. So um, it'll be more pedestrian uh, friendly and, and cycle friendly. So it may be sooner than you think. And one other question, you this is where the trails master plan kind of coincides uh, with the active transportation plan around Bob Cajun, um, Cedar Tree, and also, um, I guess, around the old old um, dam. So those definitely are going to be um, active transportation, even though it's in the trails master plan. Don't want to get too much into that, too much. I just want, but to, I just want to make good sure Good point I of that clarification. Up. Yeah. In the Trails Master Plan, there are a series of different trail classifications of which some are active modes, some are shared, and some are off-road motorized. So we have a whole classification system in that plan that identifies what type of trail and what type of user could be using it. That classification has not been applied to existing trails right now, but they have been applied to the proposed new trail linkages within that plan. That's for clarification. <laughs> on that, that yep. was a question to Parks and Rec, and they assured me that absolutely it was for active transportation. Oh, yeah, no no debate That's about that particular corridor. I was just clarifying for those who might not know the ins and outs of the trails plan, that the range of trail classifications that are in the plan, but that one uh, close to the old dam is definitely an active transportation specific trail classification. Yeah. To your point about the speed reduction, I'll just circle back on a comment that we had a bit earlier. We have looked at the tools of speed reduction to 40 as part of this plan to be able to put in and improve for walking and cycling uh, along some of these corridors. So where we have corridors where the volumes and the speeds currently say a designated facility would be preferred, but there isn't enough space, the condition is inappropriate, we have also suggested speed reductions on some of those roadways. What we will do, Pat, is we'll take a look and have a conversation with Public Works and through uh, Richard to look at what roads are proceeding like that and have that conversation about what other roads we're thinking of. There are quite a few where we're suggesting that as well. Um, yeah, the only other thing I'll say about this particular example is, is yeah, we're showing a cycle track here, I, but I think there's a lot of options on this section. The road actually also changes a lot over the course of the north-south travel, so the facility type may also change. Um, I think multi-use trails are also a great solution here, and because it's currently kind of more rural conditions, I think, you know, at some point we can get this level of detail in terms of our analysis, but the the city is going to want to urbanize this so that that with that this has some really um impressive opportunities so i sort of went we sort of kind of sort of went big by showing you the cycle track because there's not really any of those yet here and 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 not even that many in ontario so uh but it kind of shows you what could be possible because you do have quite a bit of width here in, in the wider sections you also have constraints especially the bridges through town so um you're gonna have to think about how you do the entire corridor through town um, but this is a neat one because you have some choices, some real, some challenges, but uh, some really impressive opportunities here. Yeah, Daryl. Just wanted to add, um, Pat, you mentioned that a new set of traffic lights. What was the intersection? At Canal and, and East Street, and also Cedar Street and East Street. Okay, so I'm not exactly sure the location, but with a uh, controlled intersection, there may be potential to. Um, transition the uh, facility type 
maybe um, on road south of the bridge, through the bridge, and then uh, to an in Boulevard facility north of the bridge maybe. Uh, the, a controlled traffic signal um, lends itself to um, transition. So um, that's some, just something to think about. Great point. Yeah, that's a, it's an important piece that can't be forgotten. Speaking of our previous conversation, it can't be forgotten at those intersections because it is a challenge for a transition, but it is also an opportunity to integrate design features that are a bit unique within that space as well. I'm going to move to our third out of four um, examples. So we also selected Helen Street in Fenlon. And here we have a bit of a curb, a bit of a gravel shoulder, a bit of a paved shoulder. You have a bit of no curb. Uh, the speed is 50 to 60. You're at about 5,500 vehicles per day. Uh, that puts us in a need for a physically separated piece of infrastructure along there. Uh, looking at the corridor and seeing its function, you know, it's, it's, pretty idyllic from a connectivity perspective, uh, but also looking at uh, the environment and the experience along there too. Uh, there definitely is use by a range of users. Uh, so we do need to accommodate not only cyclists, but also pedestrians and facilitating that wider connectivity as well. Uh, we do see uh, quite a bit of constraint along that corridor. And maybe that's a, a theme for these examples. We're looking for your unique insights and perspective on, you know, is it worth making these interventions happen? Is it worth improving um, because it's so constrained, uh, because it's such a great connection? Uh, but we, we do feel that there needs to be general enhancement, crossings, better walking, et cetera. So Helen Street in Fenland Falls, any thoughts? I'm getting some head nods. Yes. Yeah, I would say um, anything we can do around Fenland, it's very, very limited because of the density of the traffic that goes through small corridors in town. Yeah. So, you know, anything that sort of enhances and expands the ability to do active transportation is good because it's, it is so small and kind of restricted in Fenland. Um, I had a general question too. When you, when you describe multi-use, um, where are e-bikes in the equation? Is that all part of biking or somebody asked me to ask the question, so. A relayed question, no problem, we get it quite a bit. So uh, we know, and there was some of that previous conversation that to continue to encourage people to bike and to extend the, the life cycle of people cycling, we definitely have to start considering e-bikes uh, as part of this. Right now, it is happening on a case-by-case -case basis how municipalities by law uh, e-bikes, where they can use them, where they cannot. There is some federal and provincial guidance, which we do start to look to. Uh, these types of on-road infrastructures, like a multi-use pathway within the boulevard uh, or a bike lane, would would accommodate e-bikes. Uh, in this case, we'd probably also have to look at, to make sure that there's no prohibitive bylaws that would prevent us from doing that or make sure that we put in enabling bylaws as well to be able to, to do that and be clear about where we're expecting them to be used. Yes. Uh, yes, I think that there needs to be a conversation around uh, that type of uh, transportation. Plus, there's getting to be so many motorized modes of moving around. I've seen kids on motorized skateboards and they, you know, and when you run into a situation like that downtown and somebody zips out of a roadway or alleyway, uh, there's a safety issue there. I think that really, it's getting complicated, it's getting very complicated. And I have heard comments from cyclists that E-bikes go by them at very, you know, fast velocities. So I don't have the answer. I mean, it is just it is, but it is getting really complicated. And how we're we're going to have to have a real conversation on that. It's almost like a separate, separate item, where we're going to have to really decide pedestrians, the electric scooter boards, skateboards, etc. So I just wanted to throw that in because I don't think we're going to solve it here right now. Definitely okay. not. You're right. Yes. But um, come, I'll come back to you, Pat, for sure. I would say that 
through, for example, the Trails Master Plan, we went through quite a detailed review of existing bylaws to make sure that they were, uh, they could be updated, uh, could be amended to align with the directions of the Trails Master Plan update. We will be doing the same for municipal bylaws and providing recommendations around policy enhancements for the Active Transportation Master Plan to have its full breadth of appropriate impact. A lot of those conversations have to do with, to your point, speed and weight of the actual vehicle, and then enforcement around it as well. So definitely some future conversations, which we'll start to have around the recommendations this afternoon, and then have further conversations down the line. Yes, I know I, my one, or one of my experiences was to see someone, I think they're on motorized rollerblades or skateboard, something like that and out of a doorway in a store on Kent Street, then up to William Street and out into the traffic. And I'm thinking, you know, this is getting complicated. <laughs> okay, thank you. Pat? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm visualizing Helen Street, and, and I did a walkabout with Dan Burden many years ago, and I th were you you yeah. were on that too and and so it's a fairly wide uh, road so you know and he gave all sorts of ideas how how that could happen and I think that's a natural for sure and and to have designated areas so people can get across and then go to other other stores and you know, yeah I think it's a great idea thanks very much art uh, just just quickly on e-bikes, uh, it's the biggest growth sector in our club right now, um, and and they're fantastic because people are cycling that that were really strong cyclists, but because of physical heart problems or whatever, they want to keep doing it, but they can't do it with a normal bike. Uh, the issue is throttle bikes, and we don't allow them in our club, and the throttle bikes are the problem because they're motorcycles. That's what they are. And I think that's where that's where the differential is going to come in, and they're already classed as a different class of bike, and I think you'll find that that'll pretty well take care of that issue. They just say, no, none, none of this class allowed on, on, on this particular facility. So. Yep, absolutely right. And we don't want to be exclusionary, but we want to be clear about what is acceptable to use these types of facilities um, going forward and what's going to be the most safe and comfortable for, for other users too, from an active transportation perspective. I'll move uh, on to the last example that we had, which is Glen Arm Road, and this is a rural example. You know, in this case, uh, we have gravel shoulders, but we have an 80 kilometer speed, uh, about 3,600 to 4,800 uh, cars on that roadway. Um, you know, very strong platform space, rural context, you know, strong east west connection that we're seeing <clears throat> major destinations uh, within those areas. You know, definitely back to Art's comment previously, you know, that's not something we would ever recommend leaving as a gravel shoulder. Um, this would be something we would absolutely improve to be a paved shoulder. In fact, it likely will need a buffer just because of the mix of vehicles and the speeds, um, as well as the volumes on that roadway. But something like that, where you do have the existing platform, where you already do have the gravel there, you don't have any of those environmental um, or roadway constraints. You know, we do feel like this would be a really strong candidate for a buffered paved shoulder uh, with possible rumble strips or painted lines. Definitely uh, want to make sure that we're accommodating agricultural vehicles if you need to, as well as others, uh, and not restricting. But in this case, I uh, do think this would be a really interesting example for a new type of rural facility uh, within the city. Yeah, I'll just, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I'll just add to what you were saying, Clara, is, is, is part of the reason we kind of showed this particular example is because um, it's showing you that buffered shoulder and the new uh, updated Ontario-wide cycling guidance um, has a lot more detail, but when you include buffers along the shoulder, so this is kind of help to, to, to um, show that um, as well as lead us into uh, the conversation about the different routes, because you'll see a number of different rural routes when we look at the map in more detail. Um, so, so here's an example where you've got you've got a volume and a speed that warrants it um, to to provide a little bit of buffering. And, and like you said, uh, certainly in the in the case of buffered shoulders, you would definitely want to pave those. 
you just uh, you, if you go down Simcoe Street, you'll see that they've done that, um, and and that's happening all over the province, and they're adding shoulders, and I think that's the thing the city's got to look at because it significantly increases the road life. They're not doing it just because they want some to cycle on it. It's it's really has a, a good payoff. Um, and obviously, Glenarm Road is a major one that connects all sorts of different routes, north and south. Um, so it's a major one to look at. I'd say that sooner rather than later on that one because the road is still in reasonable shape. It's starting to fall apart a little bit on the edges, but I think they found in Peterborough County, they found it in uh, all around us that they can add uh, that to it and it has a significant impact on the life of the road. So that's one that I certainly support. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point to highlight that, that paved shoulders have a lot of benefits. They do allow for a cycling facility, but they also allow for, for farm vehicles for when people need to, to pull over temporarily. So having that, that shoulder, that extra shoulder does have a lot of benefits for your road network. Yeah, just on that, um, not to, I think it's a great idea, absolutely. And, and there's a policy now through the city that all major routes like this that are going to be resurfaced will have uh, that paved too at the side. So um, to go back just quickly, sorry, from Bob Cajun to, to Fenlon, that was deba debated many years ago and unfortunately it didn't fly, but I think that needs to be in the plan also because that was a, a, a major highway, highway eight. County Road 8 to Fenland Falls. All the way through. All the way through. And I, that should be, I mean, it was done not too long ago, but I don't know. Yeah, it was hard. Yeah. Sorry, I just had to get my bearings. So, yes, we do have a, uh, in this case, a paved shoulder shown uh, in between there. What you'll note between the built up areas and the rural maps is that. Of course, we've tried to make sure that the routes all align. So if you're seeing a primary route in the built-up areas coming out of some of those major corridors, we're generally continuing them along and making those connections, like we said in the overall network review, between the built-up areas, between the municipalities, um, and trying for that greater connectivity. So yes, that's definitely in there. Great point. Um, from the Trails Master Plan updates, so you have um, the identification of potential enhancements um, as well as uh, improvement opportunities uh, within those corridors uh, and connection points. So definitely in Fenland Falls, uh, you have very direct alignment between the Trails Master Plan update and the Active Transportation Master Plan. Uh, one of the key corridors that we think is really important, like we talked about before, is, is Helen, um, just in terms of additional connection to down Lindsay for the access to the school. Um, so not just Helen, like we talked about before, but some of the wider access. 
Uh, when you look at the walkability maps, that's where you're seeing mid-block crossings and other enhancements as opportunities there. Um, of course, Helen is right here. Kelly Rowley. Yeah, in that one. Yeah. Um, question for you. Picture, yeah. Uh, you're going. You're going through downtown Helen Falls. Yeah. It's very, very narrow. Yeah. And, and it's much more narrow now than it was before. If you ever tried to park there, it's kind of difficult to open your door. It's very dangerous for bikes to go down there. So the only way that you can go down through the main section is to take the lane. It's the only thing a cyclist can do. So I, I think the only way to do that is the same as going over the bridge. The bridge is very narrow. Is, is that the cyclist has to take the whole lane. And has to take the whole lane right down to Bond Street. Bond Street it widens out, then, then we can put in a, yep. a proper facility. Yep. But if that's part of the thinking, then I agree with that, but it would have to be well marked that this is a share the road, not, not side by side, it's like mm -hmm. this. Yep. And that cyclists take the lane, and if the speed's brought down, it won't really slow anybody down. Okay, just great point. So let me uh, hit on what we're what we're thinking here. So on that connection going through downtown on Colburn Street, as you can see, we have a physically separated piece of infrastructure. As the preferred appropriate treatment, we know that that has been reconstructed and is a great streetscape for its current design, but would require pretty significant enhancements to put in something physically separated. Right. That would be an extremely long-term project. In the interim, You're about fifty years, I think. Right? Yeah. yeah no, exactly. Seriously. No, this I know. Done. So, I know. So, I, are we whistling Dixie with these things? So, or are we so, going to turn around and say, "Here's the interim"? So, so, so I was just going to say. So okay. the interim option it would be, and there will be a couple of different corridors where we say, "Ideal, ideal scenario, very long-term. Here's something interim you can do." That would be, and I live in Kitchener, where down King Street in our main corridor, we have super sharrows, green surrounding the sharrows, share the road signs, signed by crew all the way down the corridor. Does that solve everything? No, but it does create that visual awareness and that visual understanding. That would be a very possible interim design option. To your point about the other treatments, we have a designated facility all the way along Bond, which is consistent with the Trails Master Plan update improvement for additional enhanced linkages, then up John and along Prince. So we have options on Francis, on Bond, and then a parallel route along John Street. And the other side of Bond, there's lots of room to put to put a yep. bike lane. The uh, not a yeah, to Tart's tar point, like here, here's your problem, right? It's yeah, right there, right? Absolutely. And that's, that's and, the and that's the it's a main connectivity between mm -hmm. both sides. Yeah. And because it's a moot point, the, the other thing I'm wondering, even if you try to to change like the directions and the signs and everything, and to your point, are people driving in the lane? I'm just calling out the reality of it. It is a massively busy corridor. Mm -hmm. People come all the way from the north, from the yep. south, yep. and they funnel through almost a single lane. Yep of huge traffic nonstop. So I'm just trying to visualize all the bicycles driving in the lane with all of these people going north-south through one conduit. Not to be difficult, yep. but I'm just, and I know you guys are trying to improve things, but in our, you can back me up because you, you know, the bike community. I just don't see how that's tenable. I, I mean, you, you can have the people in the bike, you know, in the lane, but I'm just wondering about all the traffic and all the drivers and all the congestion and the safety issue. I'm just, I'm just wondering about those things. And yeah. Assume that single file because it's probably less, that's exactly less it. than four meters, right? Yep. That's and that's the challenge. Meters, single single file. So in that case, your and this is why we have these feasibility discussions and also why at this point there could still be routes that come off this network, right? Because if we get to the point where we're deciding that type of investment isn't realistic or isn't possible. This would be a par pardon me, a parking removal, reallocation of space, dedicated cycle track, right? Like very, very long term and very, very intensive in terms of the type of intervention. So is it is it without any limitations possible? Yes. Is it feasible to your point? Not sure. Yeah, so yeah, we yeah. need to see something happen where this is addressed for sure because it's 
the way you get through, mm -hmm. but do we need to be too ambitious? Maybe that's not as big of a deal, but too ambitious or can we, you know, get get through it? Like even solving this, and I don't know how, how you do it physically, to your point, I just we put our thinking caps on, but, you know, you, you know, people could take the alternate routes and you don't have yep. to go all the way here. here here's your issue, because yep. it's like, it's almost like single lane for tons of nonstop traffic. Yep. And it, but it's also the connector to here, which you're thinking of trying to do, right? I mean, the value of this is this, yep. right? And that's where you start to also... But it has the congestion right there. It has the congestion. And if we could even, to your point, solve this piece, and then maybe we could start to then leverage these connection points using the trail, using the alternate routes. Yes, that is still a huge, huge challenge. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm happy to put a pedestrian, pedestrian cyclist bridge. Very often through there. Right? It's very I think, uh, I think it, in the high season, no, you don't, because it's first of all the traffic's all stopped. That's what I'm saying. So what the bikes do is they go on the right or left of the cars and yeah. then get doors. So single file means nothing. No. The traffic's not moving. It gets, it gets yeah. pretty tough. It gets pretty tough. But yeah. on the normal days and stuff like that, or during the week or something, it's not a problem. I mean, we, we just take the lane down there. And, and on the bridge, we've never had a problem on the bridge because there is no choice on the bridge. You, no, yeah. If you try well, to go to the I would say though, during during summer season and peak season and cottage season, even during the week, yeah, like people are taking vacation and they 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 come down 121 from Minden and Halliburton and yeah. it, it, it's a yep. north south artery yeah. that is that it's almost like a single lane. Yeah. So I'm just saying not not to, but, oh. you know, because I'm there all the time. So in cottage season and summer vacation season spans about two months. Yep. So even during the week, you know, when you got people on vacation and everything, it's it's really congested. That will definitely be a location where we will be having more focused conversations about Great. what is I realize the possible. challenge. I'm yeah. just trying to no, be these are very helpful. What you see every day though. Yeah. No, this right. is the context is the very helpful. Is the bridge that's being debated. I think it will go north of town. Yeah, yeah so I was I was just gonna say I mean there's the, the concession sort of bypass. Yep. Um, part of that is designed to take the truck traffic out of downtown Toronto, which is, has been sort of happening for a lot of What's the timing on that, Richard? I don't know on the percent. Um, <laughs> of, I, mean, I know we, we're, 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 uh, we're on the project. I think they're doing the PA right now. They're going through the PA process. So uh, that has to be completed and that budgeted for. Like best case scenario, are we at <clears throat> two years or two years? Five, five, five long, ten. I, I, I mean, a big thing. It is, it is. I mean, yeah. that's, you have to widen, you have to first of all widen it and then you have to redesign it for some other yeah. And it's the, it's the heavy gravel truck track. That's a great question. If that, if that, like if that, if that, that gets really. developed, I mean, it depends how many people decide that they want to bypass Fenlon and, and mm -hmm. use that to get around. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it could it could really change the complexion of the traffic issue in Meadow Falls, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So I think um, that is that is a question, and likely before we would make any changes uh, to you know to the downtown, we'd want to see what the impact of Concession Three would have on the traffic patterns, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So. So the other way you can turn left is right after the bridge, you can turn left, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we do that quite a bit. That takes it right over the trail. I, I notice it isn't marked, but it's 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 an easy turn because there's a turn lane there. It's not hard for, for a bicycle to get into that lane because you've already taken the lane on the bridge, so that's pretty easy. Yeah, we had water in there instead of oak, but I can see the validity of oak as well. To explore that as an option. Yeah, and that option, it's it's the bridge becomes the, the conduit challenge, but at least yes. at least it shortens. It, it reduces. Yeah, yeah, it reduces. And then it. you can go. You can. I see you've got a black out, but you can turn right. You know, when you turn left and you go right on that one way street, um, or it's a two way street actually. Two way. It's on May. Yeah. yeah. Go along that, and we always we always try to cross at Bond Street to go. We we go to the right there. To the right, right no, we, we turn to the right mm -hmm. here, and there's lights there. Yeah. So at those lights, we can easily turn left. There's a short bit that's really narrow, and then it widens out. Right. So 
that works well for us. Mm -hmm. But um, and I, uh, the other things we're thinking of is, and I, it triggers the conversation about you know bypass, right? Because not that we want people to be bypassing Fenland, but if you're cycling in, is it possible that you're really getting there for the destination, and that you are willing to get off your bike, and you maybe you'll want to bike through, but at least sort of navigate at a slower pace, at a slower tick, that the two very gargantuan blocks that are there um, by, you know, walking your bike or, you know, taking an alternate route, because that is more of a destination as opposed to a through sometimes. It was made I, wide the, the, you know, for walking. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, I mean, it, it hits on our other maps over there. It's like, this is great. Don't improve, the, well, some improvements. But it's some improvement, just enhancements, but generally speaking, walkability. That goes along with walking your bike, whatever. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's, so it, if we can also look at it that way and provide some alternate linkages through the touring routes that we already have, but then the Bob Cajun loop and then up and around and through, through the trails, it's circuitous, absolutely. But is that another way we can look at it? And I think what you've got further up north there is that short street? I think it's short. That's short, street. yeah. That, yeah. That is in terrible condition. It's a horrible street yeah. to ride on. You yeah. can't you can't do it. It's very, very busy. Traffic's very yeah. high. We don't use it anymore. We we, we do a, a cycle down. We we totally bypass Finland now because of because of that really? particular section. But it's already got shoulders that are all broken up. Yeah. So it could it, it just seems to me that would be a Pretty good obvious. Fix. Good good rehab project. Good fix. Yep. Yeah, I was just going to say good, good huh? project too. I mean, I know, I remember Pat when, when, when uh, County Road 8 was debated between Fenland and, and Bob Cajun. I mean, that could be that could be a project to go from sort of Fenland all the way to Bob Cajun as, mm -hmm. as yeah. sort of one, one rehab project, yeah. which would make sense from a connectivity yeah. perspective. For sure. Yeah, and, and and if you do that, the first step, then we can all go down to the point and stuff like that. Off of that, it makes it a lot mm -hmm. uh, better. That, yeah. that could yeah. be step number one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll just highlight: we haven't put all the proposed developments in the map either, but there is Richard. You had sent us a big proposed development right here, so I think yeah. there's going to be huge demand, demand and but also opportunity yeah. Yeah. in and that we're... in that area. And I think Short's going to serve. And Art, what do you make of the Holland yeah. Street? Um, this piece from your community, is that something well-ridden, well-known? No, no, it's not well-ridden. Uh, it would be. I mean, if we if we had that connectivity on County Road 8, um, that would be. And I know 35 north of Norland, Norland down to Copacup, and now have shoulders on it. So 35 slowly getting shoulders all the way down, which is which really will help things a lot in terms of this whole area as well, once, once they keep doing that. Look, I know you can't do everything, but if you had to triage it, would Helen be the priority, or fixing this because of the connectivity to Bob I Cajun? Think, uh, I think the top would be the priority, mainly because a lot of cycling groups, or not just ourselves, a lot of people start in a park mm -hmm. at, at, in Fenway, which is a constant place to start because you've got the trails, you've got everything there, it's ideal. And then you go and you can take, you can go off to uh, the yeah, point. get all the way up to Bob Cajun. So, so how long That's is, the yeah. number one. Yeah. Yeah. It's trying to save you money. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Perfect. Excellent. No, that's a very helpful question because that will be our next step in conversation is, okay, we have the roots and we have the improvements that we want to make. It'll be... How much are we saying? And in the urban area, that Elm Street, a multi-use path on the north side would make sense, but then, you know, there's probably no controlled access to transition to like a, you know, like an on-road facility that would take you to Highway 35 uh, for, you know, a touring cyclist. But, you know, for somebody that lives in, you know, Fenland that's trying to access, you know, the high school or the, uh, you know, the, the Green Hill or, you know, some of the, uh, those other, Areas in the, you know, in Helen. I mean, that type of facility makes sense, but yeah. um, the transitions are always difficult mm -hmm. if there's no control. Yeah, and so the next we wanted to show the flare because you know what we think of in terms of the potential facilities are not set in stone, and so we wanted to have these conversations. When we, the idea always is to reduce the amount of transition between different types of facilities. Yeah. That is the driver as much as as we can. 
but we do acknowledge where those transitions are and what would need to happen at those locations. So in this next step, when we come back to you with the proposed network and the facility types, there will be more circles like those where we see, okay, you're gonna to need to transition from an on-road bike lane to this at this intersection. Um, we're what ramping, does that look ramping, like? We're ramping bike lanes into the boulevard, doing setback cross yep. rides at intersections and then ramping back to bike lanes, yep. lots of things like that, because they, you, can, you can circulate cyclists through an intersection, go in any direction, um, and that way they're completing their turns from the boulevard as opposed to on the road. Um, you know, banned cyclists, you know, the turning on the road is not an issue, but uh, for, you know, in-town, uh, vulnerable, you know, recreational users, um, you know, doing, making turns from the boulevards are, are uh, preferred. Yep. Yeah, so, well, and also, it's also a lot, uh, when we were looking at some of the examples I was thinking about this, it's a lot easier. You can transition having an intersection or controlled intersection. A lot easier to transition one-way facilities into another one-way facility than two ways. Because yeah. I've seen some really messy intersection designs where you're trying to do both. Yes. So once you establish the two-way, like a two-way, um, like a multi-use trail. It's just you, multi-use path, multi-use path. Yeah. Even if you cross the side of the road or uh, you know, need to just cross an intersection and that, that, that makes sense. But, um, we're, we're doing uh, cycle tracks where, where um, you know, it's in the boulevard, we're doing directional cross rides. So, yeah, we're keeping the crossings all set back. Um, you know, everything's, you know, uh, happening in the boulevard, essentially the crossings. Uh, and if, if it's a one-way facility, we're doing directional cross rides around the intersection. Mm -hmm. If it's a two-way multi-use path, we're doing, obviously, a combined two-way cross riding intersections. Yeah. So there's lots of options. There are now, which is really lovely to have. John? Just going to move along to you. Please. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. For lunch. Thank you. I've been asking for, let's see, five years now to get Wilderness Park, which our environmental group built, colored in green on the map. So yeah. even if the city can't bring that up to snow, can you do it for this one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. Are, are you finished? Green. Green. No. <laughs> And there's also another one called Henderson Park right down here that's not colored up. Yeah, but it's well used. Yeah. Oh, no, I meant Henderson. Well, that's bigger than this. The yeah. Rest of the park is mm -hmm. Right. Um, and this is private, so whether it should be on oh. here, I don't know. The Why trail is private? Yeah, that's okay. a private uh, conifer plantation. It's owned by the people down here in Riverside. I think I think in Good that point. yeah, basic well, there's is that what you're talking about the ACB? No, it goes up here. Yeah, snowmobile. Uh, I come down Wilderness Park Road, yeah. uh, bypass the park and made that yeah. happen. Yeah. I come down here in the right of way and then they go north up to their snowmobile yep, yeah. routes. But what I wanted to say is, there's a, the unopened road allowance right here too. I thought and I, I submitted this a couple of times, but I didn't see it on the maps and maybe this rationale mm -hmm. um, to walking and cycling right around in the park. Is that a loop? Hmm. So my annoying but true rationale for that is that is something that goes in the trails master plan. Oh. Yeah. So it is part of a series of trail projects that the city has that we have identified okay. that will be considered that don't happen to be part of the 11 focus areas okay. right now, but they are aware of it and they're tracking it. Okay. So that's my, I know, frustrating, but appropriate yeah. answer. Well, understandable. And I like everything else you come up with. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> it looks good. Yes. <laughs> did, did John talk about Canal Street? No problem. Talk about Mill Street that eventually. Oh, Mill Street. Yes, that connects to the dam. Yes, well, yeah. you've got it on here. Okay. And it, it looks like, um, what is that? So that's for that's a trail, Trails Master Plan project. That's part of the Trails Master Plan project. Yep. We're working with the Court of Land Trust uh, right now to see if we can assemble more waterfront plans around here because you can't build on this. The standards are changed. Also, over here, as Richard well knows, talked to him many times, um, that's 4,000 feet of waterfront. And once it's gone, it was owned for like 300 homes 25 years ago. Well, that didn't go ahead, fortunately. But once that's gone, it all goes to development. So much limited waterfront for a public to get to. Mm. So if we can get a portion of that with the land trust help, perhaps yep. the city doesn't have to own it and maintain it and all those things. And have a, a path along there. Yeah, we the whole thing about uh, part of our active transportation was connecting things. Yep. 
whether it's trail or it's it's um, sidewalks, get things connected to the village. With some match wirings. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm sure for folks coming to Grumbling, there's a lot to digest. No pun intended. <laughs> and uh, in Lindsay, we already have comments around Antoine. We have uh, an additional consideration. We are going back and reviewing the Kimberly Street PA. In more detail, we're pretty consistent with what they with what they've recommended, but we do acknowledge the potential for the bridge improvement or the bridge development here. But this is an exceptionally, as you know, constrained corridor is what we recommended, or at least the majority of it wasn't recommended in the PA. So there's that. We've also had conversations um, about, you know, what does this look like interplaying with the with the trail and future trail improvements. Um, there is a lot, while it may not look like well, not all the streets are <laughs> are identified. There is a significant amount here. I will preface future conversations by saying, um, I don't want to remove anything, but we'll have to look at what that overall cost looks like and what the what the impact would be because this is a lot of improvement. It would be amazing. It's a lot of improvement. I will say the same thing as I did for the trail plan as well. The candidate route options. These root considerations, they don't go anywhere after this plan happens. They don't dissolve into dust or into thin air. Richard and staff get all of these details so they know what was considered. They know what uh, what we reviewed and what was analyzed. So even if something doesn't make it as part of the network, it doesn't mean those considerations and those options go away. If a project comes up that wasn't previously anticipated, where there is a capital roadway project and had removed it from the AP plan but wasn't considered it before, there is an opportunity to leverage that information. It's fluid. It's fluid, it's flexible, it's dynamic. Thank you, Matt. Right. So, um, <laughs> I'm so I'm going to downtown <laughs> So downtown Lindsay, right now, there's a couple of different options. Our primary systems are coming up through uh, Lindsay Street and then coming across on Kent. Yep. So the primary primary with Victoria and Part of the uh, Angeline and Bridge giving you the primary connections there. So we are sending it currently across the primary route, uh, across the existing bridge. I could see Colborne possibly being enhanced to a primary system link just based on the new bridge and that I've heard their commitment is putting in multi-use pathway if they can along that bridge design. Um, so I could see that being elevated, but downtown uh, built up area, you know, they're really doing like quite a bit of lines, Glen Elm, um, and also Victoria and Avenue. So how does that happen with the pre-construction? It's similar to that. Yeah. How, how is that even possible? <laughs> how does what? Yeah, it's holding it up to get rid of the angle parking. Downtown Lindsay, how, how does it work? Well, somebody who actually designs roadways as opposed to a planner yeah. would have to get into the details. However, uh, it would have to be removal of parking. It would have to be um, some pretty intensive reconsideration of the way the space is allocated for the roadway right now. Um, you know, it, I look to the cities coming up, the transportation master plan and the way the roadway classifications currently function and the way that the roads are, standards are set right now. Are the road concepts currently appropriate the way the way the communities are functioning? Probably not, uh, because they are pretty old. So maybe you need to think about some new road types, depending on where you are in the city, um, and then combine what we're thinking from the main key plan into a wider transportation strategy. Can that be kind of put in there as a suggestion? I know that it's already been done on Kent Street, but the, the Store, store owners wanted uh, the, the angle of parking, but it surely doesn't work very well for AT. So, you know, that's what and they were thinking. Well, complicate the complicated. Yeah, I, I did just, this. Oh, oh sorry. Well, I, I'm just going to say, having talked to some of them, there seem to be two kinds of versions, yeah. like two cultures. Uh, you know, some of them from the progressive sort, you can see they would love to have traffic, pedestrian traffic, slowed. Yeah, yeah, look in their window. Oh, yeah, oh, well. wonder. Anyway. yeah, yeah. That's all. So I mean, just going forward, if that could be a comment from this group, if that if they so wish. And I will start by getting into framing our next conversation uh, after lunch about the recommendations. 
is that those are types of really good recommendations to complement the network yeah. under guideline recommendations would be for the city to look at the transportation master plan and the road classifications as part of the transportation master plan to consider how multiple roads, multiple modes are incorporated into different standards. And that is a great example of a good guideline right. recommendation that would complement the network. And that's why you don't see in some of those initial recommendations the recommendation to put Penn Street on it. Because the recommendation is to accept the network, adopt the network, and to start to work on the organization. That's the recommendation with the complementary guideline recommendations of how to. Questions here. Um, I've had a few people talk to me about some of these informal paths, footpaths, and whatnot. There's more pedestrian oriented. Uh, so, and so, for instance, here on Belden Street, there's actually a worn path through this park, and these are some of these relatively short stretches. And, and there's another one over here on Broad Street Avenue. This one over. Well, oh, that's a great one. I mean, that, I'm surprised that that's not up to. What's that's, that? that? That's used quite a bit. The one from Broad Street to yeah. 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 And so I'm just thinking that maybe I wouldn't know all the informal footpaths throughout Lindsay, but there there are. Is that green line is? Can you see that green line? Yeah. That yeah. would continue to Lindsay Line Street. Yeah, it goes right through. Yeah. But that's part of it, must be part of the trails master plan. Yeah. 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 This is Broad Street here. And there's, I know there's an informal one there. And I've talked to a few people who live over here who talk about something up here that I'm not really familiar with. And that may be the one. Well, it's another connection. If you yeah. build that in place. Get a dog and walk in the area and hit all the trails. Yeah. 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 Yep. And, and there's some that maybe, you know, somewhere along the line, you take a really good look at them that may take a uh, walk, walk about like John, you had some time with you on the page and to pick up some of these things and at least have them you know, on, the, on the map. And so on the trail perspective there, and I will, to your point, Art, keep it in that category, I know it's frustrating. Um, there was a lot of work done to try to make sure that the informal maps, like you said here. Would that be in the trail? <coughs> you know, offhand, is that in the trail master plan? That, so there are 11 focus areas in the trail master plan that we've identified. Lindsay is one, this trailhead, this trailhead, and these trail connections and trailhead locations are what we are currently recommending. There is also the Lindsay Penn Community Center, which was done to look at pathways and group initial trail connections. So that one has more detail of actual projects on the ground that are being done because it was a, a first layer of it. So, so, so just that Logie and Dobson, what's the plan for that? Is that going to be a PXO? Uh, that's not, we haven't said if it's going to be a PXO or not. Um, that will be a, uh, that will be a pedestrian crossover like in the downtown. So you have, if you're on your bike, you have to physically get on your bike and walk your bike across the street. There's a couple of different options in there. I know that either the plan was, I mean, it was yesterday, but I mean, it should be available pretty soon. I can talk to Jen as well to see if we can get that uh, sent to you guys sooner rather than later. But it has all of the details of all of the types of projects that are recommended. There are four types of projects. There are new trail links, which would be one of those examples. There's trail comfort projects, which could be something like this, where it is quite constrained and you need to improve the conditions for all trail users along this corridor, but we know it's uh, somewhat uh, challenging. There's trail improvement projects, so where there's an existing trail link, where the current conditions do not fit what's being used there for, so we have to improve it. And then there are trail management projects, like the trail that you have here, where we know there's challenges in those areas, you need to manage it by putting trailheads or signage or wayfinding. 
the details are all in the trails plan, and I'll try to get those to, <laughs> to you guys as well. So is there some detail, like right here, I see this ending, <clears throat> like a dead end here? Yep. That's where you would see something like this, where we know, you know, potential future development or trail yeah, connection so, point. Yeah. So I can well. say the orange line is going to go across. Yep. Uh, yeah. We're working on the subdivision uh, for that, and we'll, <clears throat> when with the Jennings Creek comes in with theirs, that will go across to William Street. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the green line will go north through Woods of Jennings Creek and connect to. Um, Champlain. Was it Champlain up there? Yeah, Champlain. Yeah. Here. So right. that that connection will be made. It's just okay, yeah. a tricky one to get, yeah. but that connection will be made. Okay. And Alcorn will run right down. Alcorn will run up right right across to uh, William Street. Yeah. Are you talking trails about that or streets or? No, I'm talking roads. Roads, okay. which yeah. could have active transportation. Okay. So, yeah. so the Thunder so Bridge, the the Thunder Bridge road here, <clears throat> going, going uh, east, that would have shoulders on it? Is that the idea? First one here would be uh, something designated. Uh, sorry, going west. Going west. Oh, west, yeah. So that would be uh, shoulders with hopefully would, some buffer. It would connect to the rest of Thunder Bridge well, that has shoulders all the way down. I think development's going all the way up, so there might even oh, yeah. be like something like a multi use trail. A multi use trail. So, yeah, good point, sorry? Brandon. I, their development, I think, is going right up to Thunder Bridge. Yeah. So oh, I know it's going up It's going to probably be urbanized. Do you plan to urbanize that all the way around? I think. Uh, probably one side. One side. Okay. Yeah, like one so, side, uh, something that would be sense. to me yeah, like a south side multi use trail yeah. candidate. It's just we'll have to, right now, the, the grades, Could be up the way the grades are, they're fairly high in some of those areas, so we'll have to see how much land we take from, right. uh, from tribute. Uh, when they come through. But that could also be phased too, because right now it's clay rural, so maybe there might be an opportunity to, because I think there's Some already the shoulders there. But are if doing it had a shoulder on it, it would just connect to the rest yeah. of the shoulders. So, like you know, it, it, so that's right. something to think point. of going forward, <laughs> is to have both sides of the street with trails. Just, I know. Yeah. Because yeah. then you don't have to do it later. Yeah. yeah. You know, if, you, if you're going to, we're going to have all this development, then they're doing then multi use that, paths instead of sidewalks, essentially. Yeah. Ajax is yeah. Doing that. Yeah. 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 I talked to Brian Robinson about that two or three years ago. I said, "How come the sidewalks, which you always see the the um, concrete, you yeah, know, they cut heaving and so on, yeah. um, why don't you go to just the paint?" And he said, "Because the concrete lasts a lot longer than mm -hmm. the paint." But that was his opinion. I've seen so many of the what you're just suggesting was terrific. Do a yeah. three meter wide concrete sidewalk. Yeah. Well, well they, I think but so then, you know, there's the bumping. Just, you know, just, for cyclists, yeah. it's not a comfortable yeah. No, I, I was going to say the that. The asphalt is comfortable. That gives no, me, that that gets me hot in the collar. Like, the they're all I have seen ash, like, concrete paths <laughs> that, that are designed to be flat. But not, but not but not three meter wide <laughs> concrete sidewalks. No, well, you also want to communicate with them. Yeah. Claire, I had a question yeah. on the Last one, guys, because I, I swear I, I, I just feel horrible that I fell into your On all these city maps, I, I assume the plan is going to apply to the smaller hamlets as well, because none of them are identified even with a, a little mm -hmm. boring circle on the whole map. So any, any of your, your great ideas, the border plates, that will apply to those smaller communities as they grow, I assume. So the only reason why there aren't little circles of a all of them is because we committed to doing these grooming deep dives mm -hmm. for three bigger communities. Mm -hmm. But to your point, you know, you can see that we have the like, Bethany linkages and highlights of what their connections would be, as well as some of the others. So we have in our mapping where all those hamlets are, and we are trying well, I to. I understand that, them. but submit the public, for example, Got reading it. the plan. Yeah. If their names could be there in some oh, sort yeah, of way. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like Good part point. of the community. Yeah. We can talk about the, the network consideration, but um, that's part of the attraction too, uh, particularly for tourism. Yeah. You go to these small communities, they're yeah, great. They come to visit Kinmount, like yeah. see it on the map. Yep. And that's that's another really good segue into potential recommendations. Is that, uh, and it's something we've been working with other city staff around the trails plan, is getting all of this data through these projects into the city's databases mm -hmm. so that economic development and any of the other communication piece can create the mapping. Yeah. So great recommendation is ensuring that annually or biannually, to have quite a bit of a cost, mm -hmm. there are maps that are updated that reflect new projects built, that reflect upcoming projects, 
that show the progression and are more of a communication tool to the public. I'm not saying these are not, but these, as you can tell, are more technical mm -hmm. maps that are used to document the process. But a base and map, we're happy to enhance those uh, mm -hmm. as well. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I think the city could digitally update yeah, the roots. They don't website. have to. They don't have to print maps. Nope. Because everyone just uses the digital yeah. anyways. And, yeah. and if they keep those up to date, then it, that'd be a real plus. There's a. 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 Necessarily pointing fingers, but there's some great information about existing trails right now and also cycling routes in the city. Uh, we have been through that information and it is not necessarily consistent or accurate. So uh, there is definitely a pretty big effort to make sure that what we have in the plans is also reflected through anything that's going public facing for a benefit perspective mostly, but also a risk and liability. And, and, and they've changed. I mean, those routes were designed about 10 years ago. Yeah. And they haven't changed. But we now have shoulders on some roads. We've got things where other roads are preferable. We don't even use some of those routes anymore, but they're still on the website. So they're not kept up to date. Yeah. So I think that's important. On the bottom of that one, you've got a connection to Cinco, Lake Cinco, right at the very bottom. Not the very bottom, sorry, on the left hand side there. Up, 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 up. Right there. Yep. Right there. You've got you've got um, shoulders all the way down to that road which isn't marked, it's black, and I don't know why it would be black. That goes into Valencia in that area. Yeah. I have no idea why it's black. It should be green all the way down. But that road at the bottom connects right to like the Simcoe Street, which gets us right into Durham. That's it's, right. It really should be yeah. highlighted as a way for people to get into our city. Yeah. It's a night, and 49 is the other one uh, out of Bob Cajun. That links up north. 121. That can be. Done too, just to make sure we connect, like up to and, Halliburton, or we can't. And it's over. scheduled to be redone, like ne this year, so next year, there. next year. This is going to be resurfaced. Oh, really? Yep. Oh, over, that's yeah, up to up to one twenty one. So is that just resurfacing, or is that is that? It's it's it's. Uh, well? I you know what? Maybe Should that's be. what we need to talk about. But yeah. it's a, it's a boundary road, so yeah. um, it's with uh, Peterborough County. So for that example that you are providing, yeah. Art, what we're not showing but what we have in our database are all of the existing shoulder conditions. Um, so we are aware of what those existing roads are. But if you're seeing a dotted black line, we're suggesting that that get removed for improvement because there's either already something there and we don't need to do something, um, or in, that's in that case, or in another case where we feel that the condition couldn't accommodate. So that connection, if I'm understanding correct, has a shoulder, but it's not that it isn't part of the active transportation network, it's just that we're not suggesting uh, an improvement to the current condition there. I don't understand that. I don't understand, so I don't understand why the rest is shoulder, green going up, because it's already got a shoulder. It's deep, yeah. right? So we're, it already has a shoulder, up further, it's all shoulder, oh, but you got to green. So, yeah. so this needs it needs physical separation in this piece. So it needs a buffer. So that's why we've got it on the map. So because the shoulder is great there, you that's excellent. But we need to improve it a bit more to but meet. I, I, I really wonder about that. Okay, that's fine. But we use it all the time, and it's yeah. it's a wonderful place to cycle for, for drivers. Oh yeah, for, for and that's, and that's so we're, we're, we're just trying to make it better. <laughs> and, and also, it's, 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 it's also it's also not arbitrary because if we want to meet the guidelines and the standards, unless the 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 speed gets reduced our guidelines are saying okay. that it needs physical separation. Uh, the other one is 21. It comes down from Highway, County Road 8. Yes. That mm -hmm. has County Road 8 just below yeah, Balsam Lake. Highway 21, and 35, and then... No, 21 is over no, this way. It's this way. Yeah. It's north-south. Yeah, here? Like no, right? it's off Balsam Lake. Goes up to Balsam Lake. Balsam Lake? South Bay in Balsam Lake. Okay. Maybe 21. 
corner one goes all the way down. Yeah, right here. Yeah, and it's got oh, that. beautiful uh, things as well. Mm -hmm. So that is a, is a good route. And if, if, if this one gets done, then that's a really good connecting route. And it takes you into uh, different communities along the way, too. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's one that should be looked at because it's a great one to ride. <coughs> I believe we have that on there, and again, it doesn't warrant an improvement, but we could identify it from more of a green roof okay. perspective. I will say we're still trying to uh, fully integrate, figure out how we want to integrate the green loops that we have right now. You know, there isn't necessarily widespread branded signage of those. Is that an opportunity that we can look to? We are not getting rid of them. We're merely complementing them and showing the location where we have to, we believe, improve the cycling infrastructure in order to meet those guidelines and or to meet those thresholds and to make it safe and comfortable. So again, we're not seeing 21 on here because in our opinion, the current conditions are appropriate for cycling, but it does look like a bit of a failing gap um, right now. It, it's also a connectivity thing, right? Because yeah. you, you can only do so much. There's yeah. some stuff that we're kind of on the bubble, and I mean, we do welcome your input on it, for sure, but like that, that's a north south really close to the other one, so we can take you right down the way. Yeah. Take you right yeah. down here, right? It takes yeah. you to 35. Yeah. And it, that's a problem. So that's something that can be highlighted as a problem. Yeah. Starting out 35. Because we, we come over here on Ken Lee. You know, you can come over to Ken Lee and get back right into the well, no, but they are working on it. So I know. Clearly we it's we are talking to them through this process. This is through the trail plan. We were given a uh, stern warning to <laughs> back off of 35. Oh, Doug, you leave us alone, Doug. Right, really so it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Claire, okay. you did say mine was the last question. I know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was about I know. Our, I, I just couldn't. I couldn't. I will leave this marker here. You all have pens. If you would like to join the maps okay. and add more comments, please do. We will maybe leave them behind as well. Um, if that's of interest for you to mark them up afterwards and send them over to us, we'll take some photos of them as well. But please, I'm sure everybody is about to pass out from not having eaten anything for a little while.
All right, folks, uh, we're back on camera now, so we'll call the meeting back to order. Thanks very much, um, and welcome back to those in the virtual ether. Um, we appreciate that you are here if you are there on the other side. Hard to tell. Uh, we are now in part two of our agenda for the Active Transportation Task Force. We had three parts, but we only have about 50 minutes left in our agenda time. So what I'm going to suggest is that we defer the conversation about the intent and purpose of the task force to our next meeting. That conversation is meant to be about the role of the task force beyond the ATMP. So it really is more of a long-term conversation. We wanted to get it going now, but I don't think it would be too much of an issue to defer it to the next meeting just in terms of timelines for R. Is that okay with you, Chair? Okay, thank you very much. So we will focus on <clears throat> the recommendations. And in the early part of the presentation, I mentioned that a strong master plan has of this nature has two core components. The network, which we went through in some detail and will leave behind for your review and consideration over the next couple of weeks, uh, and then the recommendations. And we've had a lot of great conversation about what could be and what you'd like to have as recommendations in the active transportation master plan. And we wanted to give a bit of an overview of what we have heard so far, but also set some expectations of what recommendations can be, should be, could be as part of the active transportation master plan. So when you're talking about a functional implementation master plan like this one, or like the trails master plan update, or a forthcoming transportation master plan, you develop recommendations. There sometimes is some perception that you develop policies uh, or that you set out uh, very prescriptive guidance, and that's not the case. Recommendations in the context of these plans are meant to provide guidance to take the vision and the goals. We talked about those ambitious goals. We co-developed the vision earlier in this planning process. To, so the recommendations describe how you plan to achieve that or how you'd like to plan to achieve that. They are suggestions of how to adapt or create new policy. They are not new policies themselves, but adapt and create new policy. They establish targets for future annual decision-making process and practice. And they also look at other ways to coordinate, collaborate, and have external partnerships. So just to maybe clarify some of the expectations about what we can do and what these plans do do, um, recommendations are our core means of moving forward with work that extends the lifespan and supports implementation of the active transportation master plan. For the purposes of this plan, we are going to be developing recommendations in five categories, as you see on the screen. The first one is around guidelines. So those are around looking at design guidance or direction that helps support how we are envisioning the active transportation network unfold and the design tools and the guidance tools that would allow for day-to-day -day implementation to achieve that. Then we have policies. This is not the creation of policies, but it's the direction to update or amend or create new policies that are based on uh, how we envision the city growing and changing and come creating the vision that we would like to see. Implementation, so specifically how we build in the ability to uh, make sure that we are achieving those desired goals of safety and comfort and connectivity and doing that in a day-to-day -day way. Programming, which is building on that key goal of consistent and respectful understanding. So how do we encourage and educate people to 
uh, undertake activities and change behavior and really um, shift how we are uh, moving and participating within the community and understanding how to be active and monitoring. So that's around that kind of feasibility and that evergreen and that flexibility approach. How do we monitor, evaluate, and update what we're doing in this plan and recommendations that support that? So those are the five categories of recommendations that we are looking to. And we wanted to give a couple of <clears throat> examples of what we're talking about <clears throat> when we go into each of those categories. So in terms of guidelines, one example is guiding new development. So looking at how uh, city staff will apply the design guidance that we will develop in the active transportation plan. So bringing in design guidelines from Ontario Traffic Manual Book 18, Transportation Association of Canada, other more context specific guidance. And we are recommending that the city staff use that and apply that as the prime resource going forward. So that's an example of a master plan recommendation that would address guidelines for active transportation design in new development areas. Uh, the next one is to design for the appropriate context. And this is where we start to look at some of those specifics around some of the facility to de design. So looking at, and I know we mentioned the policy uh, that's in place right now, but looking at more specifically a direction or recommendation that says on all rural roadways, we want to see a 1.5 meter paved shoulder be implemented when a project comes up for construction. So again, that's the type of recommendation that we could build into this plan that furthers along our objectives and builds it into more of those day-to-day -day decision making. I'm just going to give a couple more examples if that's okay, Art, and then we'll cover the details through each of them. Oh, did you want to talk about that now then, Pat and Art? I just wanted to get rid of that hard pack gravel. Just take it out of it because it, we don't want it in there. And, and also on, you know, just um, built up and urban areas, you know, I, when, if somebody's looking at this plan, and, we, and we've already talked about, you know, linking Bob Cajun and Fenlon and, and up the, um, where, the other place, um, what's the other, Glen Arm, um, and that kind of goes, if, if the language is changed a little bit, it would actually fit with the program of working with other groups, but It's not, it's not just urban. That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. Under, sorry, under, under policy. Po oh, policy. Yes, sorry. That was just an example. The wording there, it wouldn't be just urban. You're right. It would be in all areas throughout the, so the city. The I thought changed. we were under the gu guideline recommendations. I'm back on board with you, Pat. I understand what you're saying. We're okay. on and, and so if you, this if slide. The, yeah, if you change yep. that, and then it would go with that. Yeah, sorry. And that's, that's where we're connecting the ambitious goals back to the specific recommendation categories, which is why you see that there, but I appreciate your comment, absolutely. Um, okay, so for guidelines, um, we're, I think we've covered those, but we'll go through the details of all of them after. Um, policy recommendations, so again, the recommendations for embedding active transportation into and updating policies so that they are reflective of active transportation priorities and direction as per the active transportation master plan. So you see one of those examples as guiding land use. You may have seen this uh, as a recommendation that came forward similarly for the trails master plan update, where we're suggesting that the active transportation master plan network be adopted or be embedded as a schedule or as a section in the city's official plan when it is next updated and that policies be amended or created to reflect the direction of the ATMP. And the second example is to uh, ensure regulations support AT. So looking at, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, other municipal guidelines or development standards or any approvals and making sure that those are all updated. So again, we can recommend through this plan that those be updated and give support in this plan and information in this plan to be able to facilitate those updates and those revisions. 
So those are some policy considerations. Implementation, uh, leveraging partnerships is one of those implementation recommendations where we definitely want to be facilitating partnerships between the city and other external stakeholders and agencies. Uh, there are a bulk of these recommendations as part of the network that would benefit from support and partnership from other agencies and interest groups, and so we definitely want to encourage that. As part of the Trails Master Plan update, we actually put together a matrix of partners that we are suggesting building on who we engaged with through that process and identifying how they would be engaged, how they su could support the plan, and what degree to which they're being engaged. We see something similar coming forward through this plan and a recommendation that supports that. Funding, of course, uh, implementation, uh, we would not be doing our job if we didn't talk about the dollars and what that looks like. Uh, there is a very ambitious budget in the Trails Master Plan update, which we were happy to see pushed forward, and we would like to see something complementary within the Active Transportation Master Plan as well. But the important part about the budgeting recommendations is that they need to be varied. So it's not just about that one line item of capital budget, but it's about what does it mean from an operations perspective? What budgets do you need to program and to educate? What budgets do you need to enforce? So we're we're trying to be not prescriptive, but um, transparent about what the costs are and what the cost implications would be. And recommendations are a way that we can uh, we can provide guidance on what the expectations are in terms of budget allocation and in terms of how we see monies being used to facilitate the implementation. Yes. This is currently a placeholder. Um, I will say it is, correct me if I'm wrong, Pat, it is 500 for the Trails Master Plan update right now, which currently is being reviewed on an annual basis, but would be the target for annual budget allocation. I think it is the... <laughs> No, that, no, that's okay. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Um, I know that we had recommended the 500 through the Trails Master Plan. I would want to see something similar here so that, again, you're seeing equal investment in Trails Master Plan and Active Transportation Master Plan. I do see the value in the approach, then, that the city is taking to have two separate plans. Again, I will say this because that's community services budgets and their funds, and this is coming from planning and, and other other funds as well. So uh, we can find opportunities beyond the capital, but that would be an initial target. Yes. Imagine what you can do for a million bucks. <laughs> Probably just Helen Street, actually. Just that. <laughs> uh, no. The next one is programming. And so that's around the education and encouragement opportunities. So <clears throat> looking at taking suggested strategies and programs that we can build into the Active Transportation Master Plan and the complementary recommendation being that planning and development would lead those educational efforts with partnerships from other agencies or interest groups or groups like yourselves uh, who are great candidates for pushing forward education and outreach. Uh, and then greater understanding, one that I haven't put in here and one that we are, but we are thinking of is around community-based social marketing and looking at behavior change and recommendations that we can put forward around how to strategically uh, identify programs that are for certain audiences to shift them to certain behaviors. Um, so that is something that we will be exploring through this plan and could explore through a series of recommendations. Last but certainly not least are the monitoring recommendations. And the two examples we gave were to remain, to maintain the relevance of the plan. So we had talked about this a little bit earlier, Richard, but ensuring that we have a recommendation that this plan is reviewed and reconsidered every five years. That's not an overhaul. That isn't a complete redo. That's taking this plan and making sure that it's still relevant, making sure that the data and the mapping and the information is up to to date and making sure that our targets are still moving forward. 
And then the second one is ensuring a walkable community. And that is a bit of programming, but also around monitoring where we you know, work with the task force, for example, in this one to undertake, and we talked a bit about this earlier, walkability audits to make sure that what is being implemented is working, what we hope to have achieved is done, and those are the types of tools that, that we can use building on partnerships to make sure that we monitor and manage some of those next steps. So we wanted to give you a flavor of what recommendations that work within a master plan like this look like. Um, and we also really wanted to demonstrate that, again, we've been listening. And so as you were sent earlier and as you have in front of you, we've put together this spreadsheet, which takes comments from the previous task force meetings, from Environmental Action, Bob Cajun, Active Transportation Plan, um, from any communication that was sent um, about potential recommendations. And we pulled out ones that sound like master plan recommendation requests. We acknowledge that there are hundreds of other comments. Some have to do with the network, so comments reflected on these maps and through the analysis, and others that are, we would like to see this type of thing in the plan, we would like to see this type of topic addressed. These are focusing on what could frame recommendations. So what we've done is we have done a bit of an assessment where we have said high, moderate, or low. So high are the ones, absolutely, we truly think those could be easily incorporated as a recommendation in the active transportation master plan. Moderate is maybe reflected in the network or the recommendations. So we think it probably could be addressed through the network enhancements and infrastructure, uh, but it could be part of a, a recommendation specifically. And low is not something that is being entertained as part of the scope of this active transportation master plan. Fortunately, as you can see, there are only two in this current list that are low. So we do feel quite confident that we can take these and incorporate the majority of them into either the network or recommendations. So let me give you, yes, yes, wheelchair accessible beach. And the second one is a neighborhood pace car. There's two sides. I should have been more clear about, I know, I'm a, I apologize, Art. That was not clear the first time. This is a two-page document. On the first side, we have run one red one, which is a wheelchair accessible beach. On the second side, we have another one, which is a neighborhood pace car. As you can tell, great ideas, wonderful ideas, just not something that we would be putting into this active transportation master plan at this time. Pat, I see your finger hesitating. Just for with the Bob Cage and active transportation plan, that's one of our initiatives and we're looking for funding through EAB to, to do that. As we speak. Absolutely, and this is not meant to override the Environmental Action Bob Cage and Active Transportation Plan. What we want to do is provide synergies between the two plans so that recommendations that you have are further reinforced through this plan so that you have greater support for the work that you're doing and so that it's not just happening in isolation in Bob Cajun, that it has the potential to happen in Lindsay, in Fenlon, in Omimi, and other areas too. And that was probably one of the comments and thoughts that we had. I mean, you look to side number two, <laughs> programming, downtown walk your town signage program. That's a really interesting suggestion that was in the environmental action Bob Cajun plan. And we think that that could be realized through the development of a comprehensive signage and wayfinding strategy that integrates the trails master plan update and the active transportation master plan while looking at localized connections within the different communities. So maybe it's a pilot project in Bob Cajun based on the work that you're already starting to do, but then you get additional support in the active transportation master plan to then build it out to other communities and other areas as well. So I'll start from side one and from the top. And what we want to do is, and we already had tons of pages up on the wall and we only have so much time. We will leave these behind, of course, but we have all of the recommendations that we have considered here. And we wanted to add to them, build on them and edit them in whatever way you see, you see fit. 
I will say that in the Trails Master Plan update, we have 27 recommendations. We are not looking to match that per se, but again, similar to the routes that are in a network, we want to be realistic about what we can implement. So I'd say there's kind of a sweet spot between about 40 to 50 recommendations. There's around 30 here right now. They're in development, right? So we just want to kind of keep that in mind as we build these out. It's not meant to be restrictive. It's meant to be kind of realistic about what we, what we can do in the breadth of them in those, in those categories. So the first one is new development standards are very important. Absolutely. So the quote unquote translation of that, that we are suggesting is the potential recommend recommendation that utilizing the active transportation design guidance provided in the ATMP city staff will review and amend existing new development standards to reflect a greater degree of clarity regarding the implementation of active transportation infrastructure. So previous conversation that we had, we can provide guidance on what that would look like. And then the city would take that away and would update through their process, the development standards that are currently in place. Okay. Excellent. I'm not, this is not speak now or forever. Hold your peace. I just want to, if there's any questions of clarification, please let me know and we can go through them. Or if there's anything that's glaringly not appropriate in your mind. Yes, John. Is this the um, format that will come out in the final report? Great question. No. Um, <laughs> this is a, a record keeping purpose so that you can see what we've taken away and what we've done with it. What we will do in the master plan will be similar to the trails master plan in that we will phase all of the recommendations so something you can do immediately medium term long term and then we'll provide supporting information and resources to be able to move that recommendation forward okay. so the next one is around safety and traffic calming and as well as pedestrianization so as you can see here uh, we are definitely incorporating traffic calming into the considerations for our network um, and we have looked to those as potential additional treatments or considerations if a desired facility couldn't be implemented. So if you can't get your cycling or pedestrian infrastructure, we would like to see traffic calming being undertaken on those corridors. Um, and that will be referenced back to the network. Uh, we also want to look at, again, the speed reductions that we talked about before, and I understand that's in development and in discussion. We would be reiterating that um, and also referencing forward the transportation master plan. And then a traffic calming policy. That is more a, again, reinforcement of something that we believe would be coming through a transportation master plan or an encouragement to do so. So you're starting to see... Uh, consistent recommendations through each of these three foundational documents that you will now have that aren't conflicting against each other. They're nicely connecting each other and reinforcing the recommendations so that when Richard goes to council, Jen goes to council, Juan goes to council, you can go to council in theory together asking for something similar or having different components of um, those pieces as part of your plans as well. Uh, bike locking stations, absolutely, definitely something we want to be looking at. So we want to make sure that we are targeting community destinations and we would be identifying specific locations within the communities to put those into place as well. So if you have any suggestions around that, uh, we would be looking for those. So what we're realizing and what we've seen is the wider range of cycling or bike parking, uh, including bike lockers or bike racks. Uh, they each have different criteria for where they are most appropriate. And so we would also provide some guidance on what those different options are, where they would be appropriate, and feed those into development recommendations or different standards that could be used as well. Turned off. No. 
looking at the uh, the principle of a riverside walk psychopath on both sides of the river, um, we have our network, and so it's kind of part of the network, but it also um, looking at how we can provide that supportive language. So where possible AT facilities are to be implemented, implemented on both sides of the roadway to ensure a continuous and connected system of routes and facilities, and then giving the background of needing rationale and consideration if that can't be achieved. So that's, you know, good due planning diligence and also requiring uh, additional reason why not if that ends up being the case too. Yep. Have you, I keep looking over here. I don't, uh, sorry there should be that. more. <laughs> <laughs> Has uh, Trent Severn been part of the conversation? I assume they have with um, some of these ideas around the waters and the parks and such. So they're part of our stakeholder group for both of the projects, definitely. Um, you, as I said a bit earlier, you are the first to see this network. We have a set of strategic stakeholder one-on-one -on -one conversations that we're going to be having with a number of key stakeholders in the next couple of months where we'll be going through specific locations that have an impact on them and recommendations that have an impact on them. So we're going to be having more focused conversations there. Um, <clears throat> I could go through all of these, um, but maybe in, I've given you a couple of examples around the guidelines. I know you also sent in some suggestions around your guidelines. You know, I think some of those still definitely apply. Uh, they are very good core principles, but I do think that there is a component of those being core principles of the plan and commitments and vision and goals of the plan that the guidelines are a bit more specific to tools that you can use to design and to um, move forward cycling and walking from a design perspective. Um, we absolutely can build in a recommendation that speaks to ensuring that the core principles of the plan and the principles of inclusivity and uh, accessibility and those sorts of things are part of the design criteria or consideration, um, but that's probably why you're not seeing necessarily words being held out in the guidelines section because it is more specific to the tools and the tactics for guidelines that these recommendations can be. Yes, Pat. Just on the bike share, um, Fenlon already has bike share and Lindsay's already applied. So unless you're looking at bike share somewhere else. I think in this case, we're seeing the expansion of the bike share system. So that is very supportive of the Lindsay request. And, you know, maybe at some point, Fenlon would also want to see. Fenlon already has. Oh, yeah. Fenlon has, but Lindsay hasn't. Yeah, I, but they've applied. But so, they've applied. Yeah, the, they have the money. The parks yeah, department it's already is done. waiting for the parks department to deliver. They Perfect. Have, they said they wanted it. So I think this would maybe be around possibly a maintenance recommendation or a monitoring recommendation. I could see that shifting into that category. I wouldn't want to miss the opportunity to reinforce what you're already doing for bike share. Because there is a cost. Right? Yes. There's a cost every year to, to look after them. So yeah. if that could be built in as, as not a capital project, but something operations. operations yeah and you may recall that we do have an operations budget um, that we have identified for the trails master plan as well similarly we would be doing the same here and that would be for the maintenance and upkeep of any active transportation infrastructure or elements that make up the network as well. yeah yeah good point yeah Art. i believe the Fenham falls one is not paid for by the city no. That, that it's totally done independently and it can be done. But I think the ideal way to look at this is a shared bike share program for all the towns. <clears throat> As we connect them up with the trails and everything else, to have someone be able to come into Lindsay and then drop a bike in Fenland Falls, like they have all over the city of Toronto and stuff like that, that might be an interesting goal to give people more flexibility. That's a really helpful clarification. So just so that I understand, um, each of these current bike shares are being used or done independently from one another. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Art. I think we would change that recommendation to be a monitoring and maybe 
programming um, type recommendation as well, where we'd want to achieve the shared bike share program citywide that's co-managed uh, maybe by city staff and external partners so that there is some of that coordination and collaboration. Yeah, I've been involved with the, um, the bikes in uh, Bob Cajun, and I don't think anybody is going to rent one of those and ride it to Fenland Falls or from Fenland Falls to, to Lindsay. They're just not um, long rideable bikes. They're really for just in the little community and around. Nice idea. Maybe the bikes will evolve over time as to be more long distance bikes, but these certainly are not. I absolutely appreciate your point. Where my mind goes is around technology and not about the bikes, but about the coordination and the payment of it. So if you had, and if we made this into more of a technology based aspect that you could have an app that you could rent a bike in Bob Cage and a bike in Lindsay and a bike in Fenlin and could transfer, you know, payment or whatever that looks like. It is definitely not about the distance cycling. It would be more about the efficiency of coordination so that if you're spending a summer in Kawartha Lakes and you've rented a cottage, you could go to Fenlin, Bob Cajun, or Lindsay and use the same technology to get the bike. Yeah. Um, yeah, so a couple of those other examples, crosswalk improvements I hit on with some of Daryl's comments. You know, <clears throat> we definitely will be looking at that through the network, and it's not that uh, it isn't a guideline. We would provide reference to d appropriate design guidance about different crossings and crosswalk opportunities, but we'll also be identifying those in the network as well, where those locations could be, as well as the potential for monitoring and identification opportunities of where you could identify and why that rationale is there for new crossings outside of the plan too. So I dare say warrants, but you know, what's that process to navigate what it looks like to identify crossing needs and, and how to go about doing that? Me again. <laughs> Sorry. He's a keener. I, I was, we can have, we I, can have two microphones on at the same time. So I propose, no, I'm joking. <laughs> oh, geez. Um, Last night I was going through these just to refresh my memory and, and get a good handle on it. And the slides I was working from had numbers for each of the recommendations. So that was easy to follow. This printout doesn't have any numbers. And um, what I was gonna recommend, because there were numbers, wherever you say see above or see below, see above, see it below, if somebody else is gonna read this in the future, it'd be nice to have numbers on the recommendations. And when you say see above, put in see above recommendation number three or number two, something like that. Because it's spent a lot of time back and forth here. Thank you. No, that's a that's a great comment. And like I said earlier, this is not the format that we will be presenting it in. So in the Trails Master Plan, uh, we spoke to you know this type of recommendation number X, this type of number X, and we had those refer backs and refer forwards. Uh, we will be doing that same approach, absolutely, uh, with the supportive information. But point well taken. Thank you, and apologies for the confusion. Or maybe it keeps keeps our minds sharp. Who knows? That maybe that's what I was going for. Um, no, confusion is not what we want. So thank you. Uh, next one is around policies, uh, changes to the official plan. Absolutely, one of our core recommendations, and we'll be mimicking some similar ones. Next one was laneway and parking lot improvements. We will be looking at the site plan requirements and also to what Richard had mentioned, you know, what we could potentially do for private improvements for active transportation. You know, the laneway and parking lot improvements, we aren't looking at those areas specifically for active transportation enhancement at this time. So it really would be about future review and future development, um, but those aren't necessarily candidate locations where we're suggesting routes or suggesting enhancements. Mm -hmm. Just for clarification, this came up in our uh, Bob Cajun plan. We did it five or six years ago. <clears throat> we had Dan Burdan, the, the uh, expert from the US come in, and he looked at all these little laneways and small parking areas in and around all the buildings on the main street. And he said, this is just a diamond in the rough. You can have little cafes, you can have little yeah. art kiosks, you can have all sorts of things during the, the good weather. So that's, we're not just talking about putting a cycling lane between two buildings. 
it's about enhancing the whole neighborhood to be more attractive to, yeah. to get visitors in on bikes and walking. And I would agree with that in the sense that the Environmental Action Bob Cajun plan is definitely more of an active communities type plan, whereas this is an active transportation master plan. And the differences I see are that, you know, we are very supportive of healthy and active built environments, but we aren't going to go as far as to say, you know, harness those spaces for cafes and that sort of thing. We will be looking at the reallocation of maybe some parking spaces for bike parking uh, or those sorts of complementary pieces. But I did notice that theme in your wonderful plan was that it felt very much like a very strong, active and healthy communities strategy, which is... and almost all ages and abilities strategy, to be completely honest, which was beautifully widespread, but a little bit beyond the details of what we have in, in our AT plan. Uh, complete streets policies, great, um, <clears throat> great example of what we can do. I would say that that may be a little bit more um, appropriate in a transportation master plan, but it's something that we can establish the framework here and provide guidance on how active transportation fits into a complete street. Um, there is more of that conversation about trade-offs and, you know, what the function of the roadway is too, which is a bit more widespread in terms of the considerations. So uh, that would likely be more there. But again, we can provide some additional support and consistency between the plans. Question over there? Yeah, that, um, was, you've answered it. I was going to ask why not um, make complete streets with sort of controlling policy for everything else, but you've addressed that. So that's okay. Thank you. That's no, th I appreciate that question too. Um, it also is about what we can create in this plan from a policy perspective, which isn't until you get it into the official plan or until you uh, build it out into some of those wider infrastructure plans, it is very challenging. These are implementation infrastructure plans. And yes, we've done a great job of making them about programming as well and education. I think that's a really great growth in these spaces, um, but we still work within the planning policy structure. And that's when we go to look into this policy section, we are trying to harness that and also influence that as much as we can. So the next one is around implementation. And I will just pause here as a reminder that this is not an exhaustive list yet. This is the compare to what has been asked of us so far and what we could develop in terms of recommendations. We'll be taking this away as well as any of your comments and questions now and after the meeting. And we'll be building out a longer list of recommendations that would span all of these categories, similar to what we have in the Trails Master Plan update. So in implementation, we have, again, the consideration of new developments. We also look at accountability to one position, partnerships and volunteer assistance, funding needs. So this is absolutely where we take a deep dive into the structure of the city right now and who's doing what and what the capacity looks like, what the processes are. Do we know what the next step is after the active transportation master plan of how to move a project forward? We want to define that. Do we know who's responsible for coordinating and monitoring the implementation of the active transportation master plan? Is that a new role? Is that an existing role? Um, so we're looking more into the processes, the practices, and the capacity uh, internally to and externally through partnerships to implement this plan and what recommendations we can identify. This is where we would encourage and support the role of a task force if there's continued interest in that or could be an, a standing committee to council if that's of interest that's where we would explore looking at those range of budgets that we talked about um, as well as uh, some of the other directions on data management and uh, support yes question about the allocation of the budget I'm just wondering um, the amount per kilometer that 
um, would be given. How does that compare with the amount per kilometer of road? I don't have getting? that answer right now. Okay. <laughs> but I'm happy to find it out I, for you, for yeah, sure. I, I'd really Again, like these, these are, so until we have the network, firmed up, we don't know exactly what that maintenance cost is going to look like right. because each type of facility is going to have a different type of maintenance cost associated with it. Once we figure that out, we will have a better idea of what we may want to budget going forward. The reference there would be based on how much you decide in capital that you're going to be implementing of the kilometers relative to what that facility will be and whether or not we decide there will be seasonal maintenance or winter maintenance. Mm -hmm. All of those references and resources will be provided in the active transportation plan and would require those annual reviews by whomever is leading the, the implementation of the plan to work with staff to bring to council what that okay. increase would look like. I was just want to make sure there's an equity there that that active transportation routes get as much money per kilometer at least as the roads do and i i was even wondering if the you know the ongoing budget if it's um a certain amount in the as a line item in, in operating that it's just an amount that as time goes by each time you're going to have to ask for that to be increased so if it could instead be a certain percentage of what's spent on roads and then it's automatically um, made appropriate each year. Just It was just a thought. Yeah. Brandon's writing down all of the thoughts and considerations over here. So uh, absolutely happy to look at whatever avenue would be. The idea is to make sure this gets adopted right as well um, and that there is monies allocated. I think you've set a really wonderful precedent in the Trails Master Plan update in the sense that there is a commitment um, to trails and we'd like to see something similar here. Um, we want to make sure that some of these recommendations are ambitious but also don't get in the way of adoption. Yeah. Just in the, in the <clears throat> sorry, silos comment, <clears throat> this has been a problem in the past. I mean, the, the planning department literally has had a difficult time getting their plans forward. We worked with them on quite a few plans that never did get through um, because everyone is in their own fiefdom. So uh, pick, um, Peterborough had one person in charge of cycling. She did an excellent job, but she was in charge of cycling, and she's the one that promoted it worked across divisions and everything else. I think, um, I'm not sure which department she worked in, but she yes, she was very, very good. Um, they just finished updating their cycling plan, by the way. They just went and approved their new cycling plan. <clears throat> That's We need something with that, that has that kind of force to it that makes it happen. Uh, if it just sits in the planning department, it won't happen. We'll have another planner quit on us or leave. It's just, it's just important to, to address that issue and say it, it has to be raised up in terms of how important it is within the city of Coyle Lakes. Great point. Um, I, again, about consistency between the plans. Uh, so in the Trails Master Plan update, we have identified a full-time employee, a partial, and then building up to one full-time employee that we would like to see. Uh, have leading the coordination and implementation of the Trails Master Plan update, we would ideally like to see that same person or someone similar doing the same for uh, for the Active Transportation Master Plan, acknowledging that Trails is in community services and Active Transportation is in planning. So it could be coordinated. The logistics of who that role and what that role could be would absolutely be able to be fleshed out, but at least identifying that as the desired outcome, somebody leading is, is the focus for us for sure. Just looking a bit at the time and being cognizant of that, um, of course, through the programming, we will be building out a series of suggested programs based on those target audiences that we had identified a little while back. So you'll hear more about those uh, at our next meeting and the connections back there. And then monitoring is about how, again, we update and we uh, keep this plan uh, flexible and nimble and relevant um, and how we 
gather data and also make sure that our information is up to date. So these two are uh, definitely evolving as well as we uh, build out the network and as we build out uh, what we are able to do in terms of gathering information and distributing it more widely. So once again, starting point, trying to definitely show you that we are listening. Um, we are looking to other resources and other examples as well. Um, we would ask that in addition to the conversation we're having today, if you'd like to think about some of the questions that we have on the screens and the slides, and the slides that you have in your slide deck, just to have a similar framework for how we're developing these recommendations, that would be very helpful. I'm on the monitoring slide right now and, you know, we'll be looking at how can the plan's goals be measured. So how can we take those ambitious goals and how can we set measurement targets for them and develop recommendations around that? Um, how can we uh, determine how the plan progresses, have annual updates and annual reviews? Uh, we'll be looking at that as well. So. Uh, not setting us to 40 to 50 recommendations, but trying to keep it realistic and build out what we have from here. I'll tweak some of these, remove a couple that are not as relevant right now, remove those that are more pertinent to the network, and then add in ones that are really going to give teeth to this plan as we move forward as well. Any other, I any questions, question. discussion? John. <laughs> Yes, it's a constructive criticism, if I may. I think you're doing a great job. I appreciate this very much. Um, whenever I and several of the other members and non-members have submitted information to Jonathan and yourself, Claire, and city staff and so on, it's usually an attachment to an email with suggestions. Never got a reply. Just a courteous thank you, we'll consider what you've submitted. I don't know whether you got the information or not. Uh, and this has gone on for a couple of years, so I just thought I'd bring that up. I don't think it's a big deal to have to hit no. return. No, and not so a big deal at all. And I think we've we've clarified a couple of uh, just our own internal communication and roles as well, and we're happy to do that. And we thought this would be a good starting point with an in-person conversation to reinvigorate that and to show, especially through this list and through the network and some of those previous discussions that, you know, we have seen all of these, we have been listening, and we've been incorporating as best as we can through our own planning and our own planning onus and due diligence that we have to go through um, to make sure that this is vetted and reviewed and considered in a really diligent way and consistent way. But a thank you, absolutely, no problem at all. I do appreciate the comment. Yes, Pat. Just on what Art was saying, we did a sustainability plan that had a big chunk in there on active transportation. So I was just wondering if that was reviewed because that went nowhere. That that was not um, green treed. <laughs> it was ga it's gathering dust, and I've got a copy of it if you'd like to see it. <laughs> no, we were provided with the sustainability plan, and it's part of the framework for both of the plans, the trails plan and the active transportation plan, that it fits in and is meant to build upon what's in there. Uh, to your point, it's disappointing when something like that happens. Uh, sometimes it does require some of these more focused plans where it's, you know, specifically diving deeper into active transportation. Sometimes those plans, even though they're really wonderful, are so widespread and have so many great ambitions that it can be difficult um, to focus in on the efforts and decide what to do next. Um, it's really great that the city is has done the trails update, now the active transportation plan and other planning processes later. If it could be just referenced. It would make me very happy. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. I believe it's in one of our previous presentations. We'll bring it forward to some Thank of you. our new ones, too. No problem at all. Yes. I had the pleasure of working on that as well. Yes, you did. 
Um, and there were a lot of volunteers involved. It was, it was a very, very strong and hard effort. <clears throat> I was warned ahead of time that be careful, you know, nothing may come of it, nothing did come of it. So yeah. uh, it, turned, have... it turned off, well, except that it got here perhaps, so it turned off a lot of people. So that's got to do with your monitoring, it's got to do with the forward role of this group. There was no forward role in terms of that, there was no follow-up in terms of making sure that it was implemented or, or that sort of thing. So it's really important for this one that we get, we have a vision as to how we're going to monitor this plan going forward and make people accountable. Thank you. We appreciate that. And that's why we, I will say there are plans that I've worked on in the past, you know, 15 or so years that didn't really talk about monitoring. And it's not just this sustainability. I mean, there are lots of active transportation plans that really focused on, you know, the network. That's not happening now, which is really wonderful. Um, and they are really important pieces, whether or not it's maintenance or management or coordination going forward. Uh, so those will definitely be highlighted and referenced in the plan too, but also recommendations that will make it stronger. So we have our next meeting in what we're hoping to be June, and that will currently be virtual. Uh, we can talk about if we need to have another in-person meeting as well. Um, we will at that time be going over the proposed network, which will be confirmed routes, facility types, transition points, walkability enhancements, some preliminary costing if we can get there. I think we can. Um, and then a more fulsome list of recommendations. And then the plan is over the summer to write the actual master plan to engage with the public on the network and the priorities that we have, and then to work on finalizing the plan at the latter part of the year. So that's the intent uh, of our next steps. Um, we had three and a bit hours today, which I'm sure wasn't even long enough um, for all of the great discussions we could have had. Uh, if you'd like to have another conversation after the group has gone through all of the materials, and if you have follow-up questions, please let us know. I will at a very minimum say thank you. We will consider your comment. No, we will have a follow-up conversation. <laughs> so uh, that is us for today. There is a lot, as always, and we look forward to hearing more about what we've talked about because it's more for discussion, I'm sure. Is there anything else that we can answer? Yes. Wouldn't be a final question without it. <laughs> Just one last question. What will the public engagement look like? Will it be a, an open house or will it all be virtual or will it be just um, everybody call or right into the website and leave your comments, which not many people pay attention to? So it'll be a combination is the plan. Uh, we're having our stakeholder meetings in the coming months. So that's kind of the kickoff. That's the first focus. Uh, we will start by launching the website with a survey and distributing that. We then will try to identify a number of events throughout the summer where we will promote the the survey, but also just discussing and having conversations about the network and the plan. I am putting this idea together as we speak right now. So we'll have these conversations with Richard and John as well. And it's likely that we'll have a virtual and an in-person public session as well. So one that people can attend if they're not able to in person and one where they can. And any of your help as always supporting any of this would be appreciated. We will come to you first before we start to roll that out so you know what is planned and what we can promote and we can go from there. Thank you for all of your time today. We really, really appreciate it. And thank you for always entertaining us for far more of your day than you need to. So thanks once again. Okay, I'd like to thank you, Claire and Jonathan, for taking the time, and Richard. Can't leave Richard out. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so this is sort of a, a new role for me, so I'm, I'm learning as I go. So, anyway, and uh, I think the in-person meeting, I think, was quite productive. And so thank you very much for that.
And before we close, any final questions from anyone? Is there a date for the June meeting? Uh, no, we are confirming that. Okay. Okay. And as I said, being new to this role, I do believe I have to get a motion to adjourn. Okay. John Bush and Pat Warren will second it. And I don't imagine anyone's opposed, so I think we'll just declare the meeting over. Okay. Thank you.